this rebroadcast of SVLG's Energy and Sustainability Summit, ESG to Carbon Free, is brought to you by Sunrun. Please enjoy the show. Please welcome to the stage Vice President of Events for SVLG, Shannon Diatley Johnson. Greetings, everybody. Welcome to the 10th Annual Energy and Sustainability Summit hosted by Western Digital. We're beyond excited to have you at our first in-person event in over two years. We wanted to thank those who came and are here with us in person, as well as those who are joining us virtually. We really appreciate your support. If you have not already done so, there are table signs um, on the table. On the back of them is a QR code. Please feel free to scan that. That has today's agenda, speaker bios, and all the information that you will need for this program. Also, you will find some index cards. Our panels will end with about five to seven minutes of Q&A. If you have a question for any of those panelists, please feel free to write that on the card, hold it up, and one of our wonderful colleagues will come around and grab that for you. And as time permits, we will have Q&A for the end of the sessions. Feel free to post, follow along on social media by using hashtag SVLGESS22. This is also found on the digital um, agenda once you scan the QR code. Thank you for joining us, and here's a few words from our thought leader sponsors, Western Digital. Silicon Valley. For the last 50 years, it's faced the world's greatest technological challenges. In response, it's created unprecedented innovation to become the economic engine of the world. And today, the world looks to Silicon Valley again as we confront global climate change, a test like no other, one that requires our resolve, our ingenuity, our leadership, and which brings us here today for SVLG's ESG to Carbon Free Summit, presented by Western Digital. Founded during the emergence of Silicon Valley, Western Digital has grown to become a leader in the storage industry, with nearly 40% of the world's data stored on their products. With over 60,000 employees worldwide and more than 14,000 active patents, Western Digital has been at the forefront of global technology for over 50 years. And today they lead by example in their commitment to sustainable manufacturing, climate change mitigation, and ethical business practices. In 2021, Western Digital set ambitious science-based targets aligned with the effort to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, driving a 42% reduction in scope 1 and 2 emissions from 2020 to 2030. They are well on their way already, achieving a reduction of nearly 7% in their first year. Here in Silicon Valley, Western Digital signed a long-term agreement last year to source 100% renewable energy for their facilities in California, which covers all their US manufacturing. But more than just acting locally, Western Digital is setting a new standard, investing in the fight against climate change globally, including in countries with limited renewable energy availability. Earlier this year, Western Digital's flash manufacturing facility in Batu Kuan, Malaysia, was named a sustainability lighthouse by the World Economic Forum, the first ever in Asia, based on innovations to meaningfully reduce water, waste, and energy consumption. Their environmental efforts are complemented by people-focused initiatives as well, including adoption of a broad global human rights policy and regular human rights impact assessments. Fighting the impacts of climate change will take advancements and efforts like those, and more. Solutions Silicon Valley is best equipped to provide. Technological, financial, ecological. Today, those conversations and connections are made here. SVLG's ESG to Carbon Free, presented by Western Digital. We'd like to thank our summit host today, Oracle. Please welcome Chief Sustainability Officer for Oracle, John Chorley. Hello, I'm John Chorley, Oracle's Chief Sustainability Officer and Group Vice President of Supply Chain Management Product Strategy. Oracle's proud to have supported SVLG's Energy and Sustainability Summit for the last nine years, and especially are delighted to host you in person again at our Redwood Shores campus this year. My role at Oracle includes overseeing the progress towards our 2025 goal of 100% renewable energy use at all of our next generation Oracle Cloud data centers and across all of our real estate and facilities. Also, halving our total emissions by 2030 over the 2020 baseline and continued reduction of our carbon footprint in our value chain in order to reach net zero by 2050. 
With ESG to carbon free as this year's summit theme, I am excited about how we can work together to pursue our common goal to achieve that future. I'm sorry I am unable to join you in person today, as I know it will be a productive summit. In this room are leaders taking the necessary steps to transform our businesses using innovative technologies, processes, and policies. I hope you will enjoy the day and learn a great deal from the environmental and business leaders that you will be hearing from throughout today's event. With that, I'll turn things back to the Silicon Valley Leadership Group to get the day started. Thank you. Our first panel at SVLG's ESG to Carbon Free Summit is Facing Change First, Western States on Signs and Strategies. Our panelists are from the great state of Washington, Becky Kelly, Senior Policy Advisor for Climate for Governor Jay Inslee. From the great state of Oregon, Jason Miner, Governor's Natural Resources Policy Director for Governor Kate Brown. And from the Golden State, the great state of California, Leanne Randolph, Chair of the California Air Resources Board. Our moderator today is Mary Holing, Vice President of Environmental Policy for SVLG. Well, good afternoon, everybody. As the West experiences severe storms, wildfires, drought, and sea level rise, today's panelists are dealing with climate change in real time. Jason and Becky, I wanted to start with you. Uh, you both advise governors who are really at the front lines of dealing with, these, with all these crises we've been seeing related to climate change. You don't need an IPCC report to tell you that it's happening faster than we anticipated. What are you seeing on the ground in your states um, as you advise governors dealing with these crises? Becky, do you want to start us off talking about what's going on in Washington? Thanks, Mary. Um, unfortunately, that is exactly the case. We are seeing impacts across our state, probably from a California perch. Um, things look pretty green and healthy and rainy in the Northwest, but we have heat domes, we have um, heat-related deaths, we have fire. Uh, we have flooding, pretty profound flooding. Um, I know the governor visited a family who had a river come through their picture window um, that left a real impression, just the, the human suffering. And we have farm workers dying from heat exposure or you know, overheating. Um, and one very particular um, industry impact in our areas are shellfish industry, which is succumbing to a combination of ocean acidification which my governor calls the evil twin of climate change, um, and also um, heat. They literally baking in their shells. Um, so we are definitely seeing the impacts on the ground all the time across our state. I yeah, just, I would. Oh, I was just gonna say, I know you and Oregon have been dealing with some really serious wildfires, so you know, fill us in on what's going on up there. Yeah, I would, you know, echo everything that the, the, the list uh, that Becky offered is a list that applies to Oregon as yeah. well as Washington. And uh, I think that we, we are in the unique position of, of just having come off the largest wildfire in state history at 417,000 acres. The bootleg fire um, made the New York Times consistently um, and I know affected air quality to the, uh, on the entire East Coast at different times, but when, I mean, I think one of the things that stands out to me about having worked with the governor on the bootleg fire, having just toured the recovery of the bootleg fire area last week, is you, know, you look at New Mexico, and New Mexico has the Hermit's Peak fire, which is their largest fire in state history at 300,000 acres. I know here in California, you had your largest fire in state history in the past three years. I think six, six of your 10 largest wildfires have happened in the past three years, including the August complex, and. Um, the Dixie Fire, and I think the stunning thing about looking at New Mexico is we probably don't know it here in this room, but not only do they have the largest fire in state history burning right now, they also have the second largest fire in state history, the Black Fire, burning at the same time, also about 300,000 acres. And those, you know, those are large numbers, and I think in these kinds of policy discussions it's really hard to uh, visualize large numbers, but 
You know, we have the cancellation of events like the Shakespeare Festival in Ashland, which leads to that institution thinking about whether or not they need to reformat, leave, change the way that they approach, uh, approach things, cancellation of numerous activities. Um, and really, you know, I think in the past three years, FIRE has gone from being sort of a sector-specific issue uh, to being an all economy and economy wide. It affects the air quality um, at the, uh, of your employees and at the institutions that um, you have from fab plants to um, data centers, it affects water quality with uh, turbidity and runoff. And so it's no longer, I think, I think for a long time, wildfire was viewed as, especially in Oregon, as something fundamental, fundamentally that the timber industry you know, had to confront. But um, in the past five years, it's so clearly become something that is economy-wide. And Chair Randolph, here in California, how have kind of the crises we've been dealing with really kind of created an imperative for the work you're doing at the California Air Resources Board? Well, um, you know, as uh, Jason and Becky discussed, it's um, these events are becoming more severe, they're becoming, becoming more common, and they are impacting the most vulnerable communities, the communities that were already struggling with air quality issues um, and that were already living in substandard housing, so they have less resilience to heat, less resilience to the significant um, particulate matter from wildfires. And so as, as we're thinking about our strategies, we are trying to think about how we orient the work to those vulnerable communities. Um, the other challenge we have is, um, is as we're mitigating climate change, um, we're adapting to it at the same time. So we are needing to um, spend a lot of um, ratepayer dollars hardening the uh, transmission and distribution system to prevent wildfire um, and undertaking other adaptation strategies uh, dealing with less water available for uh, agriculture and other uses due to drought. And those costs, again, disproportionately impact the people who are struggling to pay their bills in the first instance. Um, and so as we're thinking about how to develop these strategies, we are really trying to be mindful of um, the, the communities that are impacted most heavily in the first instance. So I think one of the reasons we really wanted to talk to the three of you today is that all of you, all of your states have uh, made pretty ambitious carbon emissions reduction targets. And I just, you know, where are we today in terms of meeting, uh, in terms of meeting those targets? If you had to, how are we doing? What could we be doing better? Um, Leanne, I'll start off with you. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll highlight a couple things. So. Uh, a 45, almost 45 days ago, we released our draft scoping plan that will get us to carbon neutrality by 2045 and also charts the path, the continued path towards reducing our greenhouse gas emissions 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. Um, and so there's a suite of strategies in that plan. And, um, and one we just took action on last week, um, we adopted what we call Advanced Clean Cars 2, which will get us to zero emission light duty vehicles, 100% sales in California by 2035. Um, and we are continuing to really focus on the transportation sector. The transportation sector is the largest um, uh, Emitting sector, if you include the um, extraction and refining of the fuels used for transportation. So really doubling down on our efforts because that sector is one of the sectors that has not moved that much. Our energy sector has seen a lot of uh, GHG reductions, um, but the transportation sector has not seen as much. So advanced clean cars too, uh, which we hope uh, our 177 states like Oregon and Washington will also adopt once we're finished. Um, as well as advanced clean trucks, which our sister states have adopted to move um, uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles to zero emission. Advanced clean fleets, which creates a purchase uh, requirement so that manufacturers know that when they are complying with our advanced clean trucks regulation, there are going to be customers who are actually gonna be buying these vehicles. All of those are important strategies. In addition to um, thinking about transportation strategies other than just vehicles. 
In the governor's proposed budget for this year, $419 million is set aside for mobility, non-vehicle mobility strategies. You know, community-based programs, um, transit, biking, things that, that will help people move out of vehicles, rely less on um, polluting vehicles and more on active mobility and uh, mobility that can really uh, move us away from the individual car, which we love so much in California. <laughs> Becky, how are you guys doing up in Washington? Well, we have similarly, not quite as ambitious in some ways as California's, but close. Uh, we have a net zero by 2050 um, goal or t limit in statute. Um, and similarly, um, what works out to about a 50% cut by 2030. Um, we have made a lot of progress in Washington state in the last three to four years in our state legislature. So things that we've been working to pass for a decade plus have kindly, finally come to fruition. So as we project to 2030, um, it looks like we are gonna close the gap and, and come close at least. Um, we're still looking for the last strategies to make sure that we get to our, our deep cuts by 2030. Um, but a lot of that has to be stood up in the next and, and set into motion in the next eight years. Um, a couple of big pieces we, um, after many, many years and back and forth and ballot measures and um, a lot of difficulty, we passed a cap and invest program very similar to California's cap and trade program in our 2021 legislature. So that is an economy wide, it covers about 75% of our emissions in Washington state, um, market based program to cap and reduce our GHG emissions. We've adopted a, uh, also in the, in the same year, a clean fuel standard. Um, so a regulatory requirement to lower the carbon intensity of our transportation fuels, because just like California, um, that is our largest uh, emission sector in Washington. We have relatively clean electricity, um, but transportation is our, one of our most um, difficult sectors to decarbonize. Uh, we passed a 100% clean electricity standard, so also a regulatory tool um, a couple of years ago, and we've been making good progress on buildings. Um, we actually, just in the last few months, our Building Code Council, um, which regulates you know, the, the codes that govern our built environment, um, adopted a standard that will um, decarbonize our commercial building sector and move it toward electrification. So we've got a whole bunch of things on the books <laughs> and they are, uh, rules are being written, they're, they're being stood up, the clean fuels and the cap and invest on January 1st. It's a lot for the system to metabolize, <laughs> the, the, the governing system and the political system. Um, but we've also made big investments um, similar to in California, our cap and invest program is expected to bring in significant revenue that we can invest in helping give people access to these clean technologies. Um, and particularly the communities that Leanne was, Chair um, <coughs> Randolph was speaking of that have borne the brunt of it and not really seen the benefits yet of the clean energy transition. So we're on a path, but we're running up the steep hill right now. <laughs> Jason, how's Oregon doing? Not gonna let me off the hook, I was, no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Well, I guess, you know, to set the stage a little bit, I'm jealous of hearing statute and legislature because if, you, um, if, you're, if you've been watching this issue, you may know that in the, past, uh, in the past several years, our legislature has, or the minority party in our legislature has walked out to shut down the legislative process specifically around cap and invest um, twice. Those were heartbreaking endeavors to spend years and years working on these projects, uh, craft them into legislation and uh, have it all fall apart at different times. Um, but we did proceed forward with an executive order um, that, that, you know, the, the echoes, I won't go through the numbers because I don't think it's necessarily worth your time, but um, it echoes everything that Becky just said of reductions in the transportation sector and reductions elsewhere. I also think the huge um, benefit of using an executive order uh, approach as opposed to a legislative approach um, ultimately was we really did bring in all, you, you, all the, all the uh, different administrative agencies of the executive branch. So, you know, one of the things that I love about what the Biden administration has sort of stepped, when they stepped out of the gate, uh, saying climate change is an all agency, right. all, all sectors issue. And I think with our executive order, we were, we were able to do that too, um, in ways that we might not have done through legisl legislation. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll, I'll riff for a second on two things. One. Um, I do think, and this, uh, I do think that in the coming year, in the 2023 session, 
it's pretty, depending on how politics in Oregon go around the gubernatorial election, it's pretty likely that cap and, cap and invest will probably be back. Um, I think that there will be an effort to codify what is currently an executive order. Um, that executive order put in place DEQ, passing rules called the Climate Protection Program uh, that are, you're, it's easy to track down that also is a phase out of transportation, tra transportation sector, uh, greenhouse gases, 80% by 2050. Um, similar uh, clean energy uh, to what Peggy described. Um, the other little tiny tidbit that's a, a riff um, on the executive order approach, and I'd encourage you and as, you're, as you're thinking about climate change, uh, the Oregon Health Authority uh, just released a report about the mental health impacts on youth of climate change. And uh, if, you, um, if you haven't been inspired to work on these issues as aggressively as you can, I encourage you to uh, track down the Oregon Health Authority's uh, summary of their interviews with youth and mental health impacts of uh, the daunting prospect of climate change. Um, so not, uh, not a metric or a measurable necessarily, but um, something that's come about in, in our work on this. So I want to dive into a little bit more about these tools that you guys are using to kind of help close, you know, meet these goals and close that, kind of close that gap. We're on a, we're on a path, but it's like, how do we get to where we need to be? Um, I kind of, I wanted to start off, Jason, I think with you coming from a natural resources lens on this, how important are things like car, are carbon offsets and nature-based solutions when we're thinking about how to, how to, how to get to where we need to be? Thanks, Mary. I think that's a, an that's a very a really complicated question and a really rich question in a lot of ways. Because um, I think nature-based solutions and, and offsets are sort of, are, are critically important. Um, but I think they have to be approached state by state and, and recognizing the strengths of each individual state. Oregon is obviously a heavily forested state. We have a, we're a great place for growing trees. Um, carbon sucking machines as the timber industry has, has pointed out and, and, and likes to be recognized for and should be recognized for. Um, but I think I would also, so I think there's great opportunity there and great opportunity for other nature-based solutions. Um, I think it's a great way in which we can collaborate up and down the West Coast. Um, I will also say though, I mean, I think the thing to always keep in mind when thinking about nature-based solutions is what Leanne has already referenced when we work with our environmental justice communities um, and in our own climate protection program that I just referenced, the state has actually made the choice to, in, to invest more directly in community-based solutions, community-based organizations. And in some ways, that's, that's, uh, the state is its own entity. It's um, you know, a, a multi-billion dollar business in a certain way. Um, but the election the state has made it from a policy perspective is to really invest strongly in the EJ approach um, while also welcoming uh, other approaches that, that, that elect to pursue nature-based solutions and offsets. And Chair Randolph, <laughs> I'm gonna have to ask you about carbon capture. I think it's a big, it's, it's a part of what the scoping plan's been, what the scoping plan has, has included in it and how, when you were thinking about the tools at your disposal at your agency, how did that weigh into it and how, how, how are you looking at that as a, as a, a factor in, in addressing our emissions? Yeah, um, I guess I'll say a few things. Um, first of all, kind of when you think about the suite of tools, um, we really need to explore as many of them as possible, right? We, we just are not in a situation where we can just afford to say, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Um, so it's really kind of a question of, what, what are you deploying and in, in what context and how are you deploying it? So I'll, I'll kind of start with that. Um, and then the way we think about um, carbon removal is, is of course, uh, nature-based solutions are really critical. Um, for the first time, the scoping plan really takes a detailed dive into natural and working lands and what the opportunities for carbon sequestration are there. Um, but then we also need to be thinking about engineered carbon removal, and that sort of broadly fits into two buckets, right? Um, carbon capture kind of at the smokestack, at the, at the um, electric generating facility, at the refinery, at the steel plant, at the cement plant. We know there are industries like cement that cannot go to zero. We know there are industries like steel, which are incredibly high heat, um, and electrification is not really feasible. Um, 
renewable fuels are a possibility for that industry, um, but uh, carbon capture is another possible solution for that industry. Um, then you get to the direct uh, air removal, you know, projects that remove uh, carbon from the air without a relationship to a, a facility. So that's an option. So in the scoping plan, the uh, CCS, you know, the, the carbon capture at the facility is a tiny, tiny sliver of what we, the reductions we're anticipating to 2045. But we do uh, have a sort of a bigger chunk that we are, um, we are sort of assigning to uh, direct air capture, and we really want to explore that technology and see what the opportunities are. I think we sort of have to recognize the opportunity for that technological advancement, but also be mindful of p the potential impacts of that, right? Like to the extent that they are high energy users, we need them to not be pulling energy off the grid that we need for our uh, transportation electrification and our building decarbonization strategy. So they have to figure out how they're gonna, how they're gonna make themselves run without taking uh, electricity from other uses. Um, we need to be mindful of communities. We need to be mindful of where these projects will be located, what community concerns are, and how we can address those community concerns. We need to be mindful um, that, uh, that we wanna make sure that those facilities have the opportunity to, particularly the CCS ones, to capture not just carbon. You know, can they capture uh, the co-pollutants? Can they capture NOx? Can they capture particulate matter? Are there opportunities um, to really make this technology beneficial, not just for our climate goals, but our air quality goals? So there's a lot of questions, a lot of things to think about. And so what we are doing in the scoping plan is kind of sending that signal that we want to talk about this. We want to explore this. We want to potentially use the low carbon fuel standard to um, uh, incent these projects. And um, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Well, no, I think you bring up a really good point, and it actually dovetails really nicely into my next question. Um, when you're looking at these kind of hosts of suite of tools when, uh, to reduce our emissions, how, how, do the, how do you factor in addressing historic, historic environmental injustices? And uh, Becky, I want to start with you and kind of the thinking that you guys are doing up in Washington. Absolutely. So it has been a growing area of concern and I think awareness and policymakers are beginning to step up to the challenge, arguably much too late, but um, we are here and we are working on it. So our Cap and Invest program, building on um, looking at the California experience, the Biden-Harris administration's Justice 40 commitment, um, our Cap and Invest program calls for at least 35% with a goal of 40% of the program revenues to be invested in overburdened communities. And we have maps that um, show the health disparities across the state where those communities are. And then an additional 10% um, for tribally proposed or tribally supported projects. About 15% of the land in Washington state is in tribal reservations. We have 29 federally recognized tribes. So they're a very important player in our state. Um, so you know, roughly half of the program revenues, which are expected to be significant, um, initially projected to be about a billion dollars of biennium, maybe, maybe higher depending on how the prices come in, um, will go into um, community-based projects that are correcting some of those historic inequities and bringing this clean future um, to everyone in the state. And we'll have a, because those communities are across the state, it will also ensure that the, the benefits and the transition are being invested in um, across the state. The other thing that I think is critical for um, the ways that we step up to environmental justice is not in kind of a, um, uh, you know, a sort of we're here to help way, but in a partnership way where we're actually listening to these communities um, because they know more than we do about how to design programs that are gonna work, um, either for their geography, for their sort of culture, for their, um, the challenges that they're facing. And so we created, at the same year that we did Cap and Invest, um, a Healthy Environment for All Act, the HEAL Act, which integrates environmental justice decision-making into how state government acts, um, creates a council of folks from around the state who are really gonna interact with executive agencies and advise on spending, on rulemakings. Um, so bringing communities into a position of sort of power and influence and especially engagement helping us be smarter, deploy the money 
better <laughs> and not think that we know from far away how best to do it. And I think both of those pieces, having those in statute um, and being accountable to them are really important. Jason, what about you in Oregon? What are you guys thinking about in terms of addressing environmental justice? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think similarly, like there's a, there are two kinds of how. There's the substantive how and the process how, and, and you know, it, it mirrors a lot uh, the Washington example where I think 10% of the regulatory obligation of regulated entities under our climate protection program um, can be, 10% of their obligation can be directly invested in community-based organizations and community-based solutions. Um, and then there's an evaluation period to see that those are actually having the effect intended. But I think even more interesting, and I didn't, I just learned something from Becky about, how, about Washington's council, but um, I've been staffed to a subcommittee of the Racial Justice Council in Oregon, which is an entity the governor established, I think just in the past, in the past two years, um, that is that, you know, I think has taken environmental justice and racial justice to a, a different level in state government of really, um, the governor n nominates and empowers a, uh, members of community-based organizations to be directly advisory, both to her, she sits with the council, to all of us, her staff, who are the interface with all the executive branch agencies, but also executive branch agencies have to present to the council and receive feedback, so ODO, DEQ, when they're talking through these programs, um, I mean, I think the beauty of it is w there's no longer any filter between community voices and the decision makers. It's embodied in a in a in a council, and you know, I think it's been a, a it's been a, a an effective way. I can certainly see the difference in the kinds of recommendations that agencies are bringing forward um, to accomplish environmental justice uh, or to further environmental justice than in previous models in state government. I'll say we should, we should have the piece that you mentioned, which is the direct interface between the governor and the council. We don't actually have that, and there is really no substitute for being in dialogue with people. Um, so I learned something, too. I can take that back. <laughs> Thank you. So I want to I wanna switch gears a little bit. I think you know in this room, we have our, a lot of representatives from the business community. As we think about uh, reaching our emissions goals, what, what commitments do you need to see from businesses to do that? And then, you know, what more could they be doing? So, Chair Randolph, I want to start off with you and get, get your thoughts on that. Well, um, I'll just give us one small example, which is that as we are thinking about um, our advanced clean fleets regulation, you know, which will be a purchase requirement um, to get to zero emission for fleet vehicles, one of the things in talking to stakeholders is so, so many folks we have talked to have said, you know, either, uh, you know, companies that service that either um, sell the vehicles or lease the vehicles have said to me numerous times, our clients want this. Our clients have sustainability goals that they want to meet. And so they want to make sure that the vehicles are there so that they can, they can uh, be able to uh, have deliveries and services that are zero emission, and there, there's a hunger for that. Um, so sort of keeping that up as, as businesses, you know, uh, setting your goals and making your goals clear to your vendors um, and the people who are um, providing you with services uh, helps the entire kind of ecosystem build upon itself to create the markets for the new products and the new strategies and the new technologies we need. You got uh, feel free to weigh in. <laughs> I think um, one thing we've found in Washington, kind of on the, on the embarrassing side of the ledger, the time between when we set our statutory limits for reducing emissions, which was 2008, and the time that we enacted a, an economy-wide program, which was 2021. But um, it, it's a, you know, it can be a slog. This work is hard. It's transformational. And I, I do think... Um, certainly on the government side, and I think probably on the business side as well, setting clear goals, ideally aggressive, transformational, disruptive goals, um, and then measuring your progress or lack of progress toward them and doing that fairly publicly, um, both so that your company is held accountable um, you know, by your stakeholders and by your leadership is just a powerful lever. Um, it's been powerful for us. 
Um, so I think that's, if I had to think of one really leveraged thing, I think sort of, and I will say, you know, a company like Microsoft in Washington State, which is committed to not only carbon neutrality, but actually pulling all the, car, all the emissions they have put into the atmosphere back out, like that is a disruptive commitment and, and, I, and we will hold them accountable to it and partner with them in accomplishing it. Yeah, I think all I would add is, I mean, I don't, I don't think, um, I don't have anything specific to add in terms of what, where we, where government needs more help, but I do think um, my advice would be more sort of structural of, you know, do something, the goals and then the strategy to actually, I mean, what I've loved about our executive order approach is implementing the actual strategy to meet those goals so they aren't just words on paper with all the executive branch agencies. So do something maybe make sure it isn't harmful or undermining of other, you know, creating, creating false expectations or harmful of others working in the space to have a, a, a to, to, to be helpful. Um, innovate, I mean, what I would love to see is more is, is people innovating in their own sector. Uh, often I feel like people reach out or business entities reach out to government looking to how they can help us. And I, I would love to see, I'd love to see great innovation that disrupts things in that sector. Um, but then I also think, you know, um, often, often another new idea isn't necessarily what's needed, and, and I would love to see businesses supporting other businesses that are already the leader um, on an innovative, disruptive, goal-reaching idea. So one of the things I think we do pretty well in government, or at least in, in, in Oregon that I've seen, is collaborating across sectors. Um, and I think you know, that's, that's something I'd love to see in our tech business community is elevating those um, partners, other entities that, that maybe already have a leadership or creative idea to help. Well, time is short. I have a ton more questions for you, but I did want to get uh, a chance to, we have some really good audience questions. Um, I think, so first, uh, a couple, uh, first off, I wanted, we got one question from the audience. Uh, how are your states reconciling their efforts to achieve ambitious emission reduction goals against short-term policy tools to relieve current economic pressures? For example, suspending gas taxes, which may impede progress on climate change mitigation. I think, <laughs> Chair Randolph, that's something you, we're, we're, we're thinking, it, that, that's a relevant conversation here in California right now. Yeah, I mean, I really feel very strongly that we need to keep our eye on the, on the long-term vision. Um, and, uh, you know, we get this question a lot with our, um, in our regulatory conversations about, you know, both in the energy and transportation space about the, the huge supply chain challenges, um, uh, materials challenges, uh, cost issues. And, you know, we have to, to, to recognize they're real and understand them, but continue to keep the eye on the ball and, and recognize that those, those things will smooth out in the short term. Um, and in the long term, we have to keep moving towards our goals and keep sending those long term signals for long term investment and deployment. Are those, are those questions that you guys are also reconciling with in Washington and Oregon, Becky? Is that something that you guys are constantly weighing? Yes, and I would say our answer in the interest of moving through questions yeah. is very similar to <laughs> Chair yeah. Randolph's, which is you gotta keep your eye on the prize, in part because um, one of the tough things, we're seeing it with supply chains now, we're seeing it with transmission siting, with clean energy siting, which is a huge challenge that we're focusing on in Washington. Um, these things take time. If you think of a solar project or a pump storage project or a transmission line today, it's not going to be ready for a while. And those 20, 30 goals are barreling down at us. So um, eyes on the prize is a part of it and assisting people in the short term. I'd echo everything that's been said. I think in addition, we have a semiconductor task force that the governor is serving on that I think, you know, you could think of it as we're, we're trying to expedite permitting uh, sort of doing, uh, helping people through multiple regulatory processes at state government, recognizing that we have to keep our eyes on the target, we can't let that go, but saving people time might be one way to save money in a stressed uh, economic situation. And I'll just briefly add that, you know, the governor's proposed budget really kind of highlights the point about you need to help people in the short term. Um, so helping people with their energy bills, with their arrearages from, you know, past due bills, all of that work is really critical um, to help people in the short term, which gives us the flexibility to keep our eyes on the long term. Here's an interesting question. 
What role does new transmission policy play in new transmission play in meeting your clear energy goals? How do you, how do we get it built? If, if you know, tell us. <laughs> um, it is, I, I will say, and this is a little bit more one of my peers in the governor's office, but um, it is essential, it is neglected, it is overdue, and we better get on it fast. Um, and we need, I think, a combination of federal leadership and regional collaboration. I, I don't know. I tend to think of some of these challenges as sort of military scale mobilizations. You think about how the president is um, using the Defense Production Act for things. I mean, that's kind of the mindset we're gonna need to get into, I think, for some of these things. And I'll give a shout out to the California Independent System Operator, who manages uh, most of the grid here in California, just released a 20 year transmission plan to really think about, you know, transmission planning had, had been done on a shorter time frame. But they really sort of said, you know what, we need to look further out, we need to plan further out because these projects take a long time um, and having that foresight is really important. Okay, I think we have time for one last question here and we'll try and land this plane on time. Uh, <laughs> given the tremendous and urgent need to find, uh, to find decarbonization efforts but also the complexity of public-private collaboration, what do you see as the most effective and efficient ways for private sector, to, private sector inventors to engage? I can take a crack. Yes. <laughs> um, so I think one of the challenges um, with private investment is balancing the disruptiveness um, versus being fast and effective. So, so frequently people will come up with an idea and sort of go, okay, well, how can I make the regulatory structure bend to fit my idea? So I would just encourage you to maybe think about it as annoying as it is the other way around. Like, you know, okay, how can I, insert my idea into the current regulatory structure and so then I don't have to sort of like go through extensive challenging processes to change things. Um, so disruptive ideas that are still within a, a regulatory thing may not may be a unicorn but that's kind of that's sort of the way I think about opportunities. I'd 100% echo that, but add the word funding to regulatory, especially with the IIJ. Oh yes, that very good. Look point. at the look at the guidelines for funding because that's yes. that's a source, and rather than trying to bend those, there there's a, so much opportunity there. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we have to wrap this up. I really enjoyed talking with you guys. Thank you so much, Becky and Jason, for flying down here to talk to us today. This has been great, and SVLG continues to look forward to working with you guys as we reach our uh, carbon-free future. So thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. For having us. The time for solar is now. You have the freedom to create your own energy, taking control of your energy future. Join Sunrun in creating a smarter energy system for the people, by the people. To introduce today's keynote conversation, please welcome to the stage Josh Parker, Senior Director of Corporate Sustainability for Western Digital. Good afternoon. I'm thrilled to be representing Western Digital today at this event that connects critical climate change issues with Silicon Valley's potential for solutions and innovation. Western Digital recognizes the urgency of these issues and the importance of real, substantive progress towards sustainability, especially in this important collaborative forum. Which is why we are so proud today to introduce today's keynote conversation speaker, former Vice President Al Gore. He has been at the forefront of these issues for decades, when too many didn't truly realize the global threat we were facing. But Vice President Gore has not only been one of the most important voices for raising the visibility of the global climate crisis, He's also been a tireless advocate on behalf of communities most at risk from the changes that it brings. Former Vice President Al Gore is a founding partner and chairman of Generation Investment Management 
and the founder and chairman of the Climate Reality Project, a nonprofit devoted to solving the climate crisis. He is also a senior partner at Kleiner Perkins Caulfield and Byers and a member of Apple Inc's board of directors. He is the author of multiple New York Times bestsellers, including An Inconvenient Truth and The Assault on Reason, and is the subject of a documentary movie, An Inconvenient Truth, which won two Oscars in 2006. In 2007, Gore was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, along with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for informing the world of the dangers posed by climate change. Today, he speaks with SVLG CEO Ahmad Thomas in our keynote conversation, Generation Climate, Forging a Carbon-Free Future. Without further ado, Vice President Al Gore and SVLG CEO Ahmad Thomas. Vice President Gore, we are honored to have you here today for our ESG to Carbon Free Summit here in Silicon Valley. Truly a pleasure to learn from you, for all the executives in the audience, for myself included. So right at the top, a huge thank you for your time today. Well, Ahmad, thank you. It's an honor to be invited. I have tremendous respect for the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. I've uh, spoken in some years past uh, to this organization. I'm a big fan of the leadership you all are providing, not only in the Valley, but uh, in our country and internationally as well. So thank you for inviting me. Well, Mr. Vice President, we appreciate that very much. And maybe on that topic of leadership and being bold and forward thinking, which has been a hallmark of ours at the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, your book, Inconvenient Truth, it's been over 15 years, believe it or not, since you wrote it. And if you look at climate and these issues, you've been clairvoyant going back to the mid 70s when you were a, a first time, a first term congressman from Tennessee. What have you seen that others haven't? And have the calls that you made, which were bold then, you might say they're conservative now, have your calls been heated around climate and sustainability in your view? Well, th uh, thanks for your kind words. All I um, did and all I have done is convey what the climate scientists were telling me and what they were telling anyone who would listen. I, I had the good fortune when I was an undergraduate in college to learn from one of the greatest climate scientist uh, in history, Roger Revelle, and that was unexpected uh, good fortune on my part, but it led me on this uh, pathway uh, that has involved uh, constant communication with the climate scientists who've been very kind and patient in uh, repeating things over and over again um, in progressively simpler <laughs> language so that I can understand it. And then that makes it possible for me to communicate it to others. And I, I wish, of course, as the scientists themselves wish that their predictions had been wrong. But as you say, if anything, they were too conservative and science is culturally inherently conservative. But in every case, their assessments uh, have been either on the mark or really understated the, the damage and harm that they warned us about. And since they were spot on, uh, we should pay more attention to what they're telling us now about what will happen if we don't finally listen to their warnings. Some have listened. Uh, we have seen some uh, halting progress toward emissions reductions, uh, but um, others uh, behaved badly. And some of the fossil fuel companies uh, intentionally misled the public. Uh, there have been some documentaries uh, put out about this on uh, uh, Frontline uh, with the BBC and uh, CBS News uh, and, and Time Magazine and others. And Naomi Oreskes and Mark Conway wrote a fabulous book uh, that researched all this. The fossil fuel companies knew their in-house scientists told them point blank. And uh, in, in too many cases, they're CEOs and executive teams made a breathtakingly unethical, immoral decision to um, hide their research. And actually they began uh, public relations campaigns uh, modeled on what the tobacco companies had done to, to try to um, prevent acceptance of the Surgeon General's report about smoking and lung cancer. Uh, they did the same thing. Uh, and 100 million people died uh, unnecessarily. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's really shocking to look back at 
the harm that was done. And there's still some of that going on. Greenwashing uh, is a big part of the problem today. But the main part of the problem is we continue to use the the sky as an open sewer, uh, and we're filling it with another 162 million tons of man-made global warming pollution uh, every day. You can see behind me this thin blue line is actually a uh, a picture from the space station uh, years ago, uh, and it, it it shows how thin the troposphere is. If you could drive a a car straight up in the air at interstate highway speeds, you get to the top of that blue line in about five to seven minutes. Uh, wow. And below you would be all the global warming pollution. And that's what we're using as an open sewer. And the accumulated, you know, it stays up there uh, for long periods of time. The CO2, which is the biggest uh, uh, source of the heat trapping pollution, uh, each molecule stays an average of about 100 years. Uh, others stay shorter, others stay longer, but that's a pretty good average. Uh, and the accumulated amount now traps as much extra heat as would be released by 600,000 first-generation atomic bombs exploding on the Earth every 24 hours. And it's kind of hard for me, any of us, I guess, to uh, stretch our minds around how much extra heat that is it, it's incredible. And, and that's essentially the reason why um, California and the West are, is, is in his, this historic drought right now. It's why six of the seven largest fires in the history of California have been in the last two years. It's why Lake Mead and Lake Powell are down below levels they haven't seen since they started filling them. Um, it, it's why the ocean-based storms are getting stronger and more destructive. It's why we have these clusters of tornadoes wreaking devastation in the heartland. It's why the ice is melting and the sea level is rising and why in some uh, low-lying island nations and some uh, low-lying delta regions as in Bangladesh uh, and, and Southeast uh, Asia and the Nile Delta, uh, agriculture is being ruined by the salinization of the soil with the rising sea level and uh, people are having to to move the temperatures are you know the 20 of the 21 hottest years ever measured have been since 2002 uh we're seeing all-time temperature records uh, broken uh this late spring and early summer the official astronomical uh, summer hasn't even started yet and we're seeing the records continue uh to fall now the good news is we have the solutions uh, but uh, this uh, truth is still inconvenient for some. It's still pushed away by some. Um, more and more people are awakening to it, and really the survival of our civilization is at stake. Well, let me double-click on that, the, the good news element. My sense is that you, you are a, a, real, a realist, yet an optimist, what are businesses getting right? Uh, Apple, Kleiner Perkins, right, where you're on the board, you're a leader, they're longtime members here at Silicon Valley Leadership Group. So many of our CEOs and executives are committed to trying to do the right thing, you know, as opposed to what the, the horrible examples you, you shared. What's going well in your estimation? Well, uh, to give you one example, uh, partly because of the incredible um, innovation in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, uh, the uh, solar electricity industry and the wind electricity industry have both matured to the point where electricity from both wind and solar is now cheaper than electricity from burning fossil fuels in almost every uh, geography on Earth. Uh, that's relatively new that we've crossed that threshold. Right. But where new build is concerned, uh, it's good news that if you look at all of the new electricity generation installed worldwide in every country last year, 90% of it is renewable. Uh, and almost all of that, solar and wind. And the International Energy Agency uh, uh, projects that in the balance of this decade and going forward, 95% of all new electricity generation will be solar and wind. Uh, on the transportation front, which is in the US, the biggest source of global warming pollution, Electric vehicles uh, are rapidly uh, uh, becoming cost competitive. Within the next 12 months, uh, 
the EV models uh, will be cheaper than their combustion counterparts in some very important categories. Within three years, uh, they'll be cheaper than their combustion counterparts in every category. Uh, we have now the promise of green hydrogen made from uh, the zero marginal cost renewable electricity. That's the flip side of intermittency when they have more being produced than demand for it. Then all of a sudden it becomes economical to crack water apart and get the um, zero emission green hydrogen. It'll take some time to scale that up, but it's coming, I'm confident. Uh, circular supply chains are coming along. Um, the revolution in uh, regenerative agriculture and sustainable forestry is extremely important. Uh, Ahmad, what, what we're seeing more broadly is uh, a sustainability revolution uh, that's mm -hmm. taking hold across every sector of our economy. Uh, it, it's uh, based in part on new information technologies uh, like machine learning and artificial intelligence, even blockchain, uh, but also developments uh, in, in uh, uh, biology and genetics. We're seeing many executive teams uh, now acquire the ability uh, to manage uh, protons and electrons and uh, atoms and molecules uh, uh, and, and proteins and genes and um, w with the same facility that the IT companies have long since demonstrated in managing bits of information. And this sustainability revolution, which features levels of uh, hyper precision that were unimaginable in the past, uh, we're, it now has the magnitude of the industrial revolution coupled with the speed of the digital revolution. Uh, and it's right. every bit as disruptive as the digital revolution. And it's producing winners and losers. But those who are first movers or early movers are way more likely to benefit from what is now being commonly understood as the largest new investing opportunity in the history of the world. Are there particular areas of innovation technology that that most excite you you got you you know satellites from measuring ghd you've got so much going on around machine learning as you mentioned artificial intelligence that's very related to potentially near term having a significant impact on improving our climate yeah i'm excited about a lot of the new uh, developments that are appearing uh i'll say first of all uh even though we have these positive developments, you know, the science fiction writer Wilson once said, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. And that's true with the sustainability revolution. Uh, developing countries where most of the increased emissions are projected uh, to, to come from in the years and decades ahead, if you're in Nigeria, you wanna build a huge new solar farm, uh, you have to pay interest rates for capital in the private market seven times higher than the interest rates in the developed OECD countries. The World Bank ought to be leading the way to fix that, but the World Bank's been completely missing in action. Uh, President Biden ought to demand the resignation of David Malpass, the head of the World Bank. I've been saying this, uh, and I ho hope the White House will, will do, we can summon the votes of among all the shareholders the, the idea that uh, facing this climate crisis, the uh, international community is not fixing uh, the access to capital uh, in developing countries uh, is, is literally um, in, insane. As the United Nations has said, the World Bank is missing in action. So why doesn't President Biden uh, fix this? I, I love President Biden. I'm a big supporter, but these things can't be allowed to just linger on. Now, let me give you a specific answer to your question. What am I most excited about? I've been spending a huge amount of my time on this new initiative called Climate Trace, uh, along with others, in, including uh, a young man named Gavin McCormick at a company called Watt Time. There are a, a dozen different uh, high-tech companies uh, uh, and universities and NGOs. We've all come together to create Climate Trace. Trace stands for tracking uh, real-time uh, atmospheric carbon emissions. Uh, and it, it's difficult to, uh, to see CO2 emissions from space because uh, looking down through the column of air that's enriched with CO2, the noise to signal ratio is very difficult. 
You can see methane, but you have to focus on individual locations. Uh, we have pulled together a new approach that's based on machine learning and artificial intelligence to collect data continuously from 300 existing satellites in the visible light range and the infrared and other wavelengths. Uh, we collect data from 11,100 sensors, ground-based, air-based, sea-based, uh, and multiple uh, data streams available publicly on the internet to generate uh, algorithms, millions of them, and then test them with machine learning. And a number, a large number of companies around the world have agreed to give us their measurements from their own boilers and their own refineries, et cetera, not for us to use, but to use for, for ground truthing so that the machine learning algorithms can constantly improve. Uh, and uh, we will publish in uh, late October of this year, the world's first ever asset level inventory uh, covering uh, the at least the 500 largest uh, greenhouse gas emitting sources in every subsector of the economy in every country. Uh, and the old phrase, so you can only manage what you measure, actually right. makes a lot of sense. And we have not had the ability to understand exactly where the emissions are coming from. We will have that now. Uh, and I've been uh, really uh, focused on this. We published the first global inventory last October at the nation state level. First time it's ever been available uh, with every sector of the economy but getting down to the facility level, individual uh, refineries uh, and power plants and uh, garbage dumps, uh, emitting methane, we're, we're gonna get it all. Uh, and I'm very, very excited about it. And we're developing uh, in concert with this inventory, uh, information about all the ownership data, who, who's responsible for each site. And we're working with NGOs and investors financial institutions and governments uh, in, in order to make the available, uh, make the information available to them so they can make it actionable as they wish to. We'll look forward to that report. And as you say, being able to get the data, being able to measure it and having actions connected to that will, will certainly be very important. Another topic connected, carbon offsets. Mm. Uh, and, and I asked the question, given our audience of corporate executives, this is something for many of our companies that's a part of their sustainability strategies. I, I notice it, it has not been mentioned by you thus far. Where do offsets fall on a, a net zero path in your estimation? Well, we the, the world has been on a, a journey <laughs> of sorts where offsets um, are concerned. They will play a role in our path to true net zero, but uh, we've had some misconceptions about um, how offsets can be a kind of a get out of jail free card. And uh, so many people piled into uh, the offset market that, that, you know, a lot of people were claiming the same offsets. Some of the forests that were claimed as offsets two years ago burned up in forest fires last year. Uh, there's been double counting. Uh, there's a lack of what's called additionality. In other words, would the forests have been protected anyway? Would the wetlands have been protected anyway, in some cases, uh, uh, areas that were already under legal protection uh, were used as offsets. Well, that's not additional, that's, that's not real. A and, uh, you know, it was tempting early on this journey for a lot of companies to say, oh, look at how cheap these offsets are. We can, we can become, you know, uh, net zero, they use the phrase loosely, yeah. by just buying up all of these very, very cheap offsets. Well, uh, it, it turns out it doesn't r really pan out uh, because we're not solving the crisis that way. But some of the offsets are valid and valuable and should be allowed. So here's where I think we are, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, uh, SBTI, uh, generally acknowledged to be the most accurate source of information about offsets. It is helping companies and other parties who want to get to net zero, create and implement uh, sound net zero pledges and action plans. Uh, and th the science-based initiative organization says that offsets can play a role, 
but a relatively minor role, and they have to be evaluated very, very carefully. They recommend that a company must reduce its emissions by 90 to 95 percent, and then and only then should they look to validated offsets for the remaining emissions. And ultimately, the key word in the phrase net zero is not net, it's zero. We all have to do all that we can as quickly as we can to get to zero emissions. Let, let, let me just say, um, Ahmad, this is uh, way more serious than most people uh, realize. Uh, right. and, and the scientists that I'm in constant dialogue with have begun to get in increasingly concerned. Uh, about 125 scientists last month, not previously activists in any way, decided to leave their labs and go and glue themselves to the doors and gates of these facilities. And they, they look, we've given you all the, the research. So there are no more <laughs> serious questions to be resolved here. We're destroying the future of human civilization. We got to stop using the sky as an open sewer. Hello. Can we start reducing emissions? So um, now one other point on the offsets. There is an important climate justice uh, dimension to this debate that's often overlooked. I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I've worked with a 97% black community in Memphis, Tennessee, in my home state of Tennessee, who's been fighting against a source of pollution that causes their cancer rate to be five times higher than uh, the national average. Uh, there have been a number of uh, spills and insults and uh, health problems that are, are really difficult. So if the, the source of that pollution, which as is commonly the case, is way more likely to be adjacent to a low-income community of color than to a wealthy uh, uh, white community, and that's just a fact. But if, if that polluting facility says, "Oh, oh, look, um, we've uh, we, we bought a forest in Bolivia, so we're good now," the the community that's still breathing in the pollution isn't that comforted by the fact that this polluter has bought the rights to offset the pollution in another on another continent, where they can't verify it. They don't know if it's real or not. And even if it is real, it doesn't stop the real damage being done to their lungs and their children and their families from the pollution. So um, this has many dimensions to it. Uh, and short answer, offsets, if they're fully validated within the context of deep emissions reductions, can play a role. They're not a get out of jail free card. They have to be scrutinized very carefully. Incredible perspective, Mr. Vice President. And on that equity point that you raised, the record is not good for BIPOC communities um, when it comes to environmental justice, as you uh, elucidated clearly. When we talk about this movement, when we talk about sustainability, when we talk about making the climate a better place, how do we do so in an inclusive manner? You've had a great track record on diversity. These aren't new issues to you at all, but they're very big issues to those communities. How can they not be left behind by all of this? Yeah, it, it's really um, important to focus on this. Uh, you know, Professor um, Robert Bullard at uh, Texas Southern University uh, has been the, the pioneering scholar of climate justice and environmental justice. And he has written a number of uh, extremely important books about this. Other scholars have joined with him. Uh, the environmental justice movement really was begun by a black community uh, in uh, Wilson County, uh, North Carolina, on the Virginia border, way back in 1982. Ben Chavis was then the head of the NAACP, and he helped to make this issue. But it was really the people in this small rural community who were awakened one day to the news that uh, poisonous PCB waste was going to be dumped uh, in their community or on the outskirts of their community. Uh, and all the dump trucks were coming down the highway. And these people uh, laid their bodies down on the highway and refused to move. Uh, and 
that was that they ultimately won that uh, struggle, but that was the beginning of the climate justice uh, movement, the environmental justice movement. I have partnered uh, with Reverend William Barber II in his uh, Poor People's Campaign. And just to give you a bit of history, you probably know that uh, more than 50 years ago, uh, Dr. King be began the first Poor People's Campaign not long before he was assassinated. 50 years later, right. uh, uh, he has picked this back up, and his co-chair is Reverend Liz Theo Harris. The original three evils that Dr. King invaded against were poverty, racism, and militarism. Uh, they have now added a fourth evil, ecological devastation. And it is a modern realization that the, the instruments of hatefulness and prejudice and discrimination were not only guns and fists and redlining uh, and, and legal measures, but also the placement of pollution flows. Uh, and uh, it is a fact all over the United States, all over the world. If we had been paying more attention to the kinds of health problems that emerged in communities of color that were victimized by these pollution flows, we would have had a head start on realizing the problem facing the entire world. Uh, but now they are inter intricately interwoven. Uh, and um, June 18th, I will be in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, with Reverend Barber uh, and Reverend Theo Harris uh, and the, uh, the Poor People's Campaign. And I will be making a speech in D.C. at the Moral March on Washington about uh, ecological devastation. Well, thank you for all that you're doing around a, a topic, as you noted, that's multi-layered, but on the other hand, just requires action. And those of us in these positions of influence taking steps in the right direction. And uh, it's a good segue to what I hope will be a positive <laughs> close here to such an insightful conversation. But talking about sustainable capitalism, I know that's the hallmark of your investment fund. I'd like to ask you what sustainable capitalism means to you and for our large corporations, for the executives and the audience, how can companies best align via their treasury functions, their, their ESG investments with the long-term climate goals we're talking about here? Greenwashing, you noted, can be a real issue even around uh, green debt and, and green bonds that might not be you know, green. So how do we best achieve that alignment? Yeah, well, you, you, you may have noted if, uh, uh, not many days ago, the federal police in Germany showed up at the headquarters of one of the largest banks. A whistleblower had told him about greenwashing and uh, the, the, the CEO resigned and uh, people may go to jail for it. So it's a, it's a, a big deal uh, and it's of growing importance. But to take the larger context, as you mentioned, sustainable capitalism seeks to maximize long-term economic value uh, by reforming markets to address real needs while fully integrating ESG metrics throughout the decision-making process. Uh, and this applies to the entire investment value chain from entrepreneurial ventures to large public companies seed capital providers to institutional investors, employees to CEOs, activists to policymakers. And for companies, thinking about sustainable capitalism has to begin with an assessment of what it is that your business values. Business leaders have to look at how they're measuring progress, both in the short term and in the long term. And the tools and metrics we use to make decisions today implicitly mark some things as significant and others as things that are safe to ignore. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, that all too often the things that are labeled as safe to ignore include uh, so-called negative externalities, uh, a, an economist uh, jargon phrase, but pollution and all the global warming pollution is a negative externality. It's not included in many accounting schemes. Also left out are positive externalities, uh, and that is the value of public goods. So, you know, uh, in, in the accounting systems that are commonly in place, if a community, for example, invests in 
education or uh, family services or mental health care. Uh, that's an expense, mark it down. But the benefits that come rolling back in in the years following are not counted as income. <laughs> so uh, you've got the expense side covered, but the benefits are externalities, positive externalities. So we're seeing you know, GDP goes up and people cheer, but we, it's accompanied by a massive increase in global warming pollution and a continued chronic underinvestment in education and healthcare and pandemic preparedness and environmental protection. We also distribute, uh, ignore the distribution of incomes and net worths uh, to the point where 1% of the world's people have 46% uh, of the world's wealth. And we're now at levels of hyper inequality, not only in the wealthy countries, but in the developing countries uh, as well. And these metrics also ignore the uh, depletion of critical natural resources like underground water aquifers, uh, a looming issue, not only in California, but elsewhere. Uh, the the uh, strip mining of our precious topsoil, we're losing a great deal of it with the emphasis on heavy plowing. We need to shift to regenerative agriculture. So in any case, businesses ought to begin by pulling back from the narrow uh, focus on short-term profits for one of their stakeholders, the shareholder, uh, and instead seek to identify where their companies intersect with and have an impact on the environment, on human rights, social justice, and more. Uh, their other stakeholders, of course, are their employees and the communities where they're located a and the employees and communities in their supply chain, the environment in which they operate, the, the ethics and values in the C-suites and how they permeate the entire company. So multi-stakeholder capitalism is connected to sustainable capitalism uh, and far-sighted business leaders uh, are now really focusing on making this transition. At least that's the experience that I have had watching some of the best and brightest. And our theory, uh, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, is that those companies actually, with that far-sighted leadership, can be more profitable in the near term. Absolutely. Vice President Gore, thank you so much. And for those in the audience, if you're not fired up and inspired after hearing this conversation, you might, might be in the wrong room. We're truly honored to have you Thank you for the insights and perspective today. Thank you, Ahmad, and thank you for the invitation. While the last year held more unprecedented challenges, Lyft stayed focused on their core mission to improve people's lives with the world's best transportation. Founded in 2012, Lyft has one of the largest transportation networks in the United States and Canada. This network brings together rideshare, bikes, scooters, car rentals, and transit all in one app. Lyft continues to hold themselves to the highest possible standard, maintaining accountability, all while pushing themselves and the industry forward. As part of that mission, Lyft is committed to providing a comprehensive alternative to private vehicles. Lyft has already helped remove an estimated 9 million cars from our roads, and as their platform grows, they are committed to making the Lyft platform 100% EV by 2030. Lyft also owns and operates North America's leading shared bike and scooter network in 11 markets across the US, which provides city dwellers across the country with sustainable transportation options to replace car trips between one and five miles. We are proud to sponsor ESG to Carbon Freeze Premier Panel, ESG, from investments to impacts to innovation. Please welcome the moderator of the panel and SVLG CEO, Ahmad Thomas. Well, it is great to have our audience here in person, live and full effect for our 10th annual SVLG Energy and Sustainability Summit. And a shout out and welcome to everyone listening online to the live stream. You're missing out on food and the camaraderie today, but hopefully next year when uh, we, we can get together more, we'll see you. Today, we have focused on the single most pressing issue in the sustainability space, which is the climate crisis. It's clear we need to take bold, swift, and large-scale action to confront this existential challenge. I'm proud to see so many SVLG member companies rising to the challenge in monumental ways. 
And today we've convened an incredible slate of speakers and panels to explore what's working and share with you where we need to double down on our efforts. We just heard our keynote with Vice President Al Gore. I hope you found that insightful and his perspective uh, certainly I thought was fascinating. It And you heard as we closed the topic of sustainable capitalism and the rise of ESG investing was covered. And that's the subject of our next panel. Our new vision of corporate citizenship in Silicon Valley embodies accountability, equity, inclusion, and environmental stewardship. It embraces our startup roots with an entrepreneurial approach to policy, partnerships, and public and private investments. And the tenets of ESG are deeply interwoven into this new approach. During this time of uncertainty and challenge, our collective work is needed now more than ever before. I'd like to introduce our panelists who will help us explore how ESG policies and investments are being leveraged to create greater shared value and a more sustainable, equitable, and inclusive society for us all. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Ama Anaman, Managing Director, Head of Structured Products, and G Associate General Counsel at NASDAQ. <laughs> the Honorable Betty Yi, Controller of our great state of California. Ellen Jakowski, Chief Sustainability Officer at HP. And Joshua Parker, Senior Director, Corporate Sustainability at Western Digital. Controller Yi, we're honored to have you here with us today. Thank you. I'll start with you. And audience members, jump in with your questions. We'll make sure we have time to get to them so this incredible panel can speak directly to you. Uh, but Controller Yi, when we look at ESG and we look at the metrics and how you approach this, given your role on the CalPERS board, CalSTRS, that's about $800 billion uh, worth of assets, give or take. Speak about the ESG lens, please, and how California is, is leading in this very, very important area. Thank you, Ahmad. And um, first, let me just say it's great to be in a room full of like-minded leaders who are moving in the same direction to really tackle um, one of the greatest existential threats that we are facing, as we've heard from uh, former Vice President Gore. And I mention this because I think one of the things I do want to say, just to uh, preface my remarks, is that as we're all really doing this work together, uh, we are also facing some um, headwinds, frankly, that are coming at us that really are questioning uh, the, um, the whole ESG framework uh, within which we are doing this work. And uh, Vice President Gore spoke about, um, you know, one of the instances has been getting a little bit of coverage lately, but, um, you know, we know, we know that we have been spending a lot of time, many of you in this room, on the E of the ESG. Uh, I think the G, we see many great examples of what corp companies are doing relative to diversifying their boards and bringing in uh, the competencies that are needed to get through uh, this uh, period of, uh, you know, I think tremendous opportunity. Uh, but also, uh, as we focus on the S, I think this is where uh, we have not really been as uh, assertive and as aggressive. And so I hope that as we look at these headwinds that we are not deterred by what we are continuing to do, uh, but also understanding that we have to be smarter about how we approach this. And I believe that's really the philosophy behind the work of CalPERS and CalSTRS. That you know, every time I think about these issues, I think about the three million members uh, for whom I am responsible for guaranteeing uh, retirement security uh, from our public sector, from our public sector uh, uh, workers to our educators, 
who are really depending on us as trustees to uh, be sure that we are putting their assets to work. And so both pension funds have long recognized ESG issues, even before it was popular. And uh, it wasn't that long ago that uh, there were many debates about whether fiduciary duty included ESG considerations and in investments. And here we are now looking at the integration of ESG considerations across all of our asset classes throughout our portfolio. And so I think that's major, major progress. But as the prior panel alluded to, um, this is a long-term view. It's a long-term lens but at the same time recognizing that our world is changing quickly before us. And so we do engage um, with many of our companies, and I'm, I want to just give a shout out to Western Digital, uh, because they've really been a model you know, with respect to how to look at um, the challenges and the opportunities. Um, I was just saying to Josh earlier that uh, uh, bless Western Digital for tackling scope three, which I think is really some of the toughest uh, uh, information that we need to move forward, um, but I also believe that uh, Perfect uh, should not be the enemy of the good in terms of already having enough with scopes one and two information to move forward. So as long-term investors, we um, obviously um, seek to incorporate ESG as a risk factor. It is a uh, risk factor that uh, is, gets considered in our due diligence process uh, with all of the investment decisions that we make. And this means working to manage the risks, uh, looking at capitalizing on opportunities that are associated with climate change, with corporate governance, uh, executive compensation, and also human capital management issues. And so uh, both funds have signed on to the principles for responsible investment. Uh, this has been a longstanding um, uh, relationship uh, where we have been signatories of the UN PRI. And we're also working with other investors to uh, improve transparency in the disclosure of ESG uh, by, by the companies in, uh, where we invest. And so this is not um, kind of an add-on, and I just really want to uh, emphasize that. For many of you who are looking to you know, do work with CalPERS and CalSTRS, um, both funds have committed to net zero pledges. And uh, the CalPERS being, uh, since 2019, one of the earlier uh, members to sign on to the UN uh, as Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, and then last fall, CalSTRS, after many, many years of uh, just really looking at analyzing our climate change impacts to our portfolio, uh, understand the, the financial and physical risks, are, uh, did uh, also uh, adopt a net zero pledge as well. So we've got, begun to put together our, our net zero action plans. And uh, more importantly, uh, we are in the process of doing this really, uh, I think, difficult work. And I know as a, as a trustee with my colleagues, uh, this is very, very difficult. And that is, how do we begin to include interim milestones that keep us accountable in terms of making that progress and also understanding that along the way uh, that we're going to probably need to do some course corrections. But uh, I'm hopeful that we will reach net zero before 2050 if we're held accountable and that we're all moving in the same direction. Well, thank you, Controller Yin. That's a good segue maybe to Josh from Western Digital. And we've covered this at the top, but I think it's worth repeating. I'll, I'll read the statistics here. Western Digital committed to reduce its scope one and scope two emissions by 42% by 2030. Scope three emissions intensity by 50% that same year. And then the green infrastructure uh, pledges and the green infrastructure work underway and already in Northern California running on 100% renewable energy, some of the other global statistics. Josh, can you speak to the, the strategy behind those decisions and maybe to, to pin it down a little bit, the economics of that? Is there a near-term economic benefit to Western Digital to these choices and decisions, or is it, is it a longer-term strategy? Yeah, it's a great question, and we have seen that case for sustainability become even more clear for companies, I think, over the past few years. So I've been in this role for three years now, and I've seen a dramatic shift, I think, in the appreciation of what a corporate imperative it is to make strategic sustainability progress. And you see some of the studies that demonstrate correlations or non-correlations between sustainability and, um, and corporate success, financial success for companies. Um, and the takeaways that I see from those studies are if the sustainability programs are really tailored to the unique company at issue, if they're strategic and focused on high impact projects, then they do support the bottom line. They, they are accretive to, to company value. And so the approach that we've taken at Western Digital is, is data driven and we are you know, a data storage company so it makes sense. But um, uh, when we started this journey, we went through a very detailed process of mapping out our company and trying to decide where are our impacts 
and what are the levers that we can pull to try to reduce those? Not just within our operations, but throughout our, our value chain, right? Looking upstream and downstream, uh, where are those impacts? And, uh, and to Controller Yi's point, on, on the social side as well, um, because we're looking at, at all opportunities for us to, uh, to do what's right, but at the same time to add corporate value. And the clamor that we're hearing from our customers, which include HP, um, is, is just growing louder and louder uh, for us to reduce our emissions, to protect human rights, to use more recycled content in our products. And so it's, it's increasingly clear that there is a direct tie between very strategic, very prudent sustainability initiatives and, and financial success. Even for companies like ours that are in the manufacturing industry where we have um, unavoidable, you know, significant electricity consumption to, to manufacture our storage products. Um, there are ways that we can focus on, you know, uh, securing renewable energy. Again, even in places where access to renewable energy is very limited, either for regulatory or infrastructure reasons. So the, the approach that we've taken is to do a lot of research, um, collect as much data as we can, and then focus our efforts and I think there, are, there is a distinction between projects that have long-term value and projects that have short-term. And depending on the maturity of your sustainability program, you might need to focus more on the short-term ROI projects first as you build momentum and as you build the, the case for sustainability within your company. But uh, that momentum can grow, and we've seen that at our company where um, as you start building your reputation based on real substantive progress, but as you start building your reputation as a sustainable company, the momentum builds and more and more people get excited about it and it becomes a positive differentiator for the company. It, it's valuable with, um, with customers, it's valuable with investors, and I've been on a lot of calls with our, our large shareholders, um, including uh, you know, CalPERS and CalSTRS uh, and Franklin Templeton, about where is the value and, and the, the tie between shareholder value and sustainability. And for our employees, uh, we just recently started an employ uh, environmental affinity group at our company to help get our employees more involved, more aware of sustainability issues. And it's, it's really a, a self-reinforcing process. Uh, and across those three key stakeholder um, metric, or groups, we've seen a lot of interest and a lot of value. Well, Josh, I'll turn to your customer, uh, Ellen. You've been vocal as an SVLG board member about your climate work. Uh, your, your CEO, Enrique Lores, was on the board previously, very vocal about the work that HP is leading around climate. Some of the statistics here, HP is committed to reduce its value chain scopes one, two, and three GHG emissions by 50% uh, uh, by 2030, achieve net zero emissions by 2040, carbon neutrality and zero waste in all HP operations by 2025. You had a billion dollar sustainability bond, which was path breaking um, in, in uh, the investment world. The question for you, and it's not to draw any false moral equivalence between a, a profit motive and doing the right thing, but for the business executives in the audience, I do want to ask the question, is there an economic benefit to these decisions? Are you able to drive more revenue near term due to these decisions? And, and what is, to the question I asked Josh, what is that strategic calculus that HP makes in pretty bold decisions around climate and sustainability? Yeah, well, thanks so much, Ahmad. And again, it's an honor to be here today in person, uh, as well as online with all of you. Uh, so at HP, as you mentioned, you know, we've set some of the most ambitious and comprehensive climate action goals uh, in our industry. And with that, you know, there's a lot of work for us to do. So the 50% reduction uh, by 2030, the absolute uh, 40% uh, by, or sorry, absolute um, net zero uh, by 2040. So with some of these goals, again, you know, we need to figure out how our business can change. How do we transform to meet these goals? And uh, two weeks ago, we just published HP's annual sustainable impact report. It was our 21st year of reporting. So that's quite a long time uh, in the world of sustainability reporting. And in that report, we also announced a number, $3.5 billion in new sales due in part to our actions on sustainable impact. And the way that we are calculating that is by monitoring our enterprise RFPs. 
So if our enterprise customers are you know, asking us questions about human rights, about climate, about our carbon footprint, about the energy efficiency of our products, uh, we calculate that as a customer who is interested in purchasing based on our uh, offerings in sustainability. And again, I'll repeat that number, $3.5 billion in new sales. That's up from over a billion dollars the year before. So it's clear. Not only does HP need to change, we've made big commitments to change, but our customers want us to change, and they want us to move as fast as we possibly can. I think as human beings on this planet, we're all feeling the impacts of climate change no matter where we live, and here in Northern California, we certainly are with the wildfires and, and uh, many other issues that we're watching around the world, including in Yosemite right now, mm -hmm. um, or Yellowstone. Yellowstone. Yellowstone before they... Yellowstone. Uh, but Yosemite as well is, is facing these things. So, um, so in terms of you know, how do we action that, what does that look like inside the company? You know, we've set these goals. We've worked on a comprehensive governance structure uh, inside the company where every single leader has accountability. Each of our L1 leaders, so direct reports of our CEO, have an MBO where they're compensated on their actions tied to sustainable impact. Are we on track to meet our sustainability goals? Uh, and of course, their performance is measured that way. We've then trickled that down to all 53,000 HP employees, where through our performance management system, uh, we're empowering every single HP employee to set a sustainable impact goal. There's no way our company is going to achieve these goals if we don't have the full power of our full employee base working towards that. Um, so really excited to see the energy that that's creating and the innovation that that's driving inside. Um, and in fact, we do an annual survey of our employee base. We just finished that survey, and we asked them a couple questions. One, are you empowered? Do you feel empowered to create sustainable impact for the company? And then two, are you actually taking action? Did you do something? Small, big, doesn't matter, but something to help HP be more sustainable. And this year, the, the points are up 11% for those that feel empowered, and they're up 14% for those that feel uh, that they've taken action. And if any of you know employee surveys, getting them to move by 1% or 2%, that's, you know, that's amazing. But 11%, 14%, uh, HP employees are committed to this. And then, of course, comes the supplier question, right? How are we managing across our value chain? Because that's the scope where we've set our goals. It's not just about HP and our own operations. It's about how we're fundamentally changing the industry as well. And so partnering with uh, excellent suppliers like Western Digital and many others to set goals um, so they understand what we need to do and how we have to have them on board to help us achieve these goals. Well, I really appreciate the point, uh, Ellen, that both you and Josh made around accountability, right? Because there are skeptics out there that hear these wonderful, ambitious pledges, but then want to see the follow through and, and to hear the steps and frankly, you talked about tying results to comp, right? The mm -hmm. steps you all are taking to ensure accountability. I think it's, it's heartening. And to Ama, maybe I would turn to you next, a, a two-part question. One, greenwashing. Just uh, if you could speak to that. I, I'm a inv former investment banker. I've done ESG deals. I know that some deals are more uh, authentically climate friendly than, than others. So can, can you speak to what you see around greenwashing and trends? And then maybe at a macro level, the SEC and their guidance that came out in March around more climate related disclosure for public uh, issuers. What feedback are you receiving uh, around that from NASDAQ clients? So first on greenwashing, well, we see that companies are really facing an alphabet soup of ESG metrics. And some are mandatory based on jurisdiction, but many are not. And even then, there's a strong interest from investors and other stakeholders for companies to engage along these metrics. But we understand that one size doesn't fit all for these companies. And so if you think of, for example, a small or a mid-sized company, they might not even know where to begin reporting some of these metrics either privately or publicly. So at NASDAQ, we've created a voluntary ESG reporting guide. And our hope is that it can act as a reference guide for companies that want to begin voluntarily reporting these metrics so that they can better understand what investors are typically asking for from companies and also just to navigate these different frameworks out there. And then to your second point, um, on the SEC's recent proposal. 
So I guess first, we, we do commend the SEC for their efforts here to increase consistency and reliability in climate-related disclosures. But we have a unique vantage point because we're an exchange, we're a public company, and we provide ESG products and services as well. So what we've heard from listed companies is that you know, while they're creating these laudable goals and sustainability efforts, they are concerned with the complexity of this proposal and the costs and the burdens that it could impose on public companies and suppliers and ultimately investors themselves. So there's some concern that it could undermine the commission's goals and we conducted a survey of over 200 listed companies to get their views on the proposal. And we learned that 41% of companies think it will cost at least a million dollars a year for them to comply with this proposal. And we have a lot of community banks listed on NASDAQ. And every dollar that they spend complying with this proposal is a dollar less in capital formation and they provide the majority of loans to small businesses and farmers. And we've heard concerns that it could make access to capital more difficult for them if they have to provide the scope three data for the banks to report it to the SEC and they're not ready to provide it. So we've provided a few constructive alternatives for the SEC to consider. And one would be a complier explain framework similar to the UK where companies could look at the SEC's proposal as a menu of disclosure options and then carefully choose which disclosure items they're ready to provide under robust internal controls. And then as they mature in their reporting, they could provide additional disclosures. And we're also asking the SEC to provide meaningful safe harbors for companies and extended phase-ins for newly public companies and acquisition targets. So we submitted a comment letter to the SEC on Tuesday, and it should be public later this week. Well, I, that's a, a very important perspective, um, and some, something we'll certainly stay close to. Mm -hmm. And maybe a follow on there, Controller Yi, mm -hmm. looking at, at ESG, you know, going back to ESG as an asset class, um, in your role with CalPERS and CalSTRS, or frankly speaking to large but you know, public instrumentalities, uh, have ESG holdings been uh, accretive to returns for your shareholders? I would say the focus in terms of um, that question, Ahmad, is probably more appropriately focused on has it been helpful in terms of our um, view about reducing risk. I think with respect to returns, um, you know, both of the pension funds um, really do have, um, take our fiduciary duty really seriously about safeguarding our beneficiary retirement payments. And so that is our sole focus in terms of the work that we do. And as we think about returns, um, you know, there's not, I mean, the, the noise around us is um, definitely political and moral and all the, the arguments around uh, ESG, but um, you know, when you look at sound investment analysis, it really does have to do with um, you know, fitting into our risk and return guidelines. And uh, because we don't, uh, because we integrate ESG uh, in our risk analysis across all of our asset classes, uh, we don't uh, have a separate R ROI that tracks our ESG investment returns. Um, that is probably, I think, from my perspective, good, so that we don't take our eye off the prize in terms of the long-term nature of the view that we need to continue to have relative to our portfolio. Um, we uh, do also look at um, you know, just uh, continuing to build on some of the track record that we have had, um, albeit small. Um, Calsters, for example, has um, made investments in low-carbon transition readiness ETFs, and we continue to uh, build on that. Um, we also have uh, both funds really are now more focused on um, private market investments. And so to the extent that uh, we can look at this ESG framework as uh, something that is already embedded in uh, what, how we do business in the private markets, I think that's really what we have been spending a lot of our time on, that this, again, uh, just as we've done in the equities market, this does not become an add-on conversation, that it's mm -hmm. uh, completely embedded in, in the decisions in our, in our private asset classes. So uh, all told, uh, CalPERS has more than 20 billion dollars invested in low carbon solutions and green investments. And as you'll see from the variety that I'm just going to talk about, it really is uh, spread out throughout the portfolio. Um, we have about uh, $12 billion um, 
are approximately 18% of our combined uh, private ass assets in invested in climate solutions. This is in our real assets as well as private equity and sustainably certified buildings. Um, and uh, 425 million invested in green bonds under our fixed income asset class uh, and $7 billion uh, plus invested in our uh, low carbon transition solutions in our uh, pu public equities uh, uh, portfolio. Um, last year when CalSTRS did approve um, our new sustainable um, investment and stewardship strategies, uh, this is something that we feel is gonna be um, helping us get much more focused on uh, investment opportunities in the private markets that, um, uh, that are gonna include low carbon solutions uh, that meet the fund's uh, risk return objective. So, but the goal is uh, going forward that uh, we will be investing between one and $2 billion uh, per year over the next two years on low carbon solutions. And this includes, by the way, affordable housing. So really looking in the real assets um, uh, area for op those opportunities as well. I, I thought the point about not being an add-on, but actually being you know, an entrenched part of your, your decision-making yeah, and the value system, that in, integrated value system, that's important. Um, um, I want to double click on one of your points, and, and this is for, for everyone here on the panel. So you're in the audience, you might personally be inve uh, interested in investing uh, around the ESG asset class, or maybe you have a company, uh, a smaller company that has no engagement around ESG whatsoever. You know, where do you start? What, what guidance would you give, and maybe for uh, Josh and Ellen, for companies that are looking to, to do more around ESG, where, where do you start? I'd, I'd ask you first, Sama. Well, I do think it's important to understand the ESG topics that are most relevant to your business and your stakeholders. So for example, at NASDAQ, we conducted a materiality assessment to help us better understand the topics that both our internal and external stakeholders found most relevant for our company. And what we learned was that they considered business ethics and data privacy and cybersecurity and diversity as the most relevant ESG topics. And so now those insights inform our sustainability strategy and help support our ESG disclosures as well. So I would suggest um, that companies consider conducting a similar assessment to understand what's most material to their company and their stakeholders. And, and for Josh and Ellen and Controller Yi, I'd also be interested in your perspective for the municipal leaders in the audience about where they, they might start with their city or county if they're looking to engage more around ESG. But uh, Ellen? Yeah, well, I'm, I think a materiality assessment is certainly important. We've been doing um, that for, for many years as well. Uh, but having an idea of you know, where you meaningfully can take action, setting those targets, and then making sure that you are authentically taking action and bringing everyone with you. you know, I mentioned how we're trying to empower our full employee base, right? So the things that we all need to do, they're much bigger than us. And so the only way we're gonna do it is by figuring out how to, how to create the right behaviors, the right incentives. We have a big challenge, for example, with motivating our customer base to be part of the solution along with us. And we have a responsibility to do that. How do we make it easy for our customers to recycle, to return products back to us, to be excited about reusing products that are on their second life and not just their first life? Um, being excited about the amount of recycled content, just like we are. That, that, creates you know, the need for behavior change. So figuring out what your plan is, what your targets are, taking real meaningful action, and then figuring out how to bring people together with you. I, I will just say that um, I think in this space, the whole notion of uh, thinking globally and acting locally probably has a lot of uh, impact. That um, what we see around us in terms of the needs for uh, mitigating and adapting to climate change, I think, are becoming much more real and much more tangible. And from that perspective, I mean, looking at the alignment between um, what uh, you and your companies are doing, uh, what your local communities are doing, what your local governments are doing, what your state governments are doing. You know, this is, um, as I look at kind of the work that we do at the pension funds, it's not just in the investment space, but it's also around policy advocacy. It's also around um, certainly getting involved in the rulemaking process of the SEC. Uh, but it's also about, you know, looking at uh, some of the attributes that we have within our own communities uh, as far as, um, particularly in the private um, space now, uh, the private market uh, opportunities. 
Uh, there are many, many, uh, every day we hear about new innovations with new funds being created, and I think some of the, the innovations that we're going to be aware of at the pension funds are going to come you know, from those initiatives um, that are um, you know, growing locally and scaling up to where we can look at them as potential investment opportunities. I would add that I think there's a lot of sustainability noise out there. It's been such a hot topic for so long, um, including in the investment community, that companies have gotten out over their skis in some situations where they want to uh, portray themselves as sustainable companies. And um, you know, there's the old adage, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to anything, right? And if, <laughs> if you look for opportunities to highlight what looks like a really sustainable story for your company, you can find that. And you can put it in a beautiful sustainability report, and that's great. The, the challenge that we have, and have had more historically than we have now, is being able to compare companies so that you actually identify the companies that are leading and making the most substantive progress in sustainability. And I think we're moving in a world where the key stakeholders, including investors and uh, customers, especially enterprise customers, are more savvy. And they're able to cut through some of that noise and say, OK, I have a CDP disclosure here. This is, you know, at least for scopes one and scope two, more or less apples to apples. Scope three is a little more complicated, hard to compare. But um, I think there are more opportunities with standardization um, of reporting frameworks, as well as potential regulation which has its own challenges, but the more we can move to standardized metrics where we're honestly comparing real substantive progress year over year, uh, the more accountable companies will be for their actual sustainability impacts and the more progress we'll make as a whole. Well, seven minutes, we're gonna rapid fire through these questions. And yeah, speaking of savvy and sophisticated, clearly we've got a sophisticated audience here, but I'll start with uh, Alan, a question for you. What kind of accountability is built around suppliers that you work with? Any performance measures uh, and reporting uh, that you can speak to or, or assistance to them? Yeah. Um, so again, as I mentioned, our suppliers are a huge part of our footprint. Our carbon footprint is large, uh, and over 60% of that comes from our supply chain. That is the biggest area where we need to work together to figure out you know, how to get to net zero by 2040 and that 50% reduction um, by 2030. So within that, you know, we actually just finished a series of workshops with our suppliers where we brought them all together um, and spent a lot of time digging deep into some of the fundamental issues that we have. Um, of course, one being access to renewable energy, depending on where our suppliers are located uh, all around the world. And, and uh, we have a whole policy position around how we're working together with governments uh, to change that, to make renewable energy more accessible for our suppliers. Um, we also, of course, in the material space, uh, need to spend a lot of time working on new materials. So we're, we're, we have a solid start on incorporating recycled content into our products. In fact, um, from our personal systems business, 95% of the products that we've launched this year so far contain recycled content. So uh, we're well on the way there. But the availability in the scale that we need of that material uh, and how to get that all back to us and to our suppliers and assure the source of that material is really important, as well as working through some of the issues when you use recycled content in your products, there can be some quality issues um, and, and other things that we have to work through. Uh, we've gotten over uh, many of those hurdles, but more, of course, remain in front of us. Um, so I think having a very partnerial um, view on it as well as one that's tied to very specific actions and targets. And so within our plan around how we aim to get to that 50% reduction, um, we have five levers that we're really pushing on, and we have detailed plans around each of those, as well as metrics broken down year over year between now and 2030, what targets do we need to hit, and what do our suppliers need to hit? Um, and I think having those clear measurements, as well as that collaborative approach, that's gonna get us there. Well, thank you, Ellen, and, and this might be a controller for you or for, for Ama. How can we ensure that ESG funds maintain their integrity and environmental mission? Recently, ExxonMobil was listed in the top 10 holdings in the S&P 500 ESG index, which seems uh, to be against the mission of an ESG index. Yeah. On a green card, too. <laughs> No, great question. Um, I think the first panel alluded to this, and that is, um, 
you know, obviously there's some, uh, in the short term and the near term, um, you know, these companies are having to deal with the realities of what is happening around the world today. Um, obviously, we've seen through the Russian-Ukraine war uh, what has happened with respect to uh, oil and uh, just the demand, uh, the continued demand for oil as we see supply being constrained. Uh, but, but this is, this is uh, where I say it's a, it's a long-term game. And uh, I, I will mention that with respect to CalPERS and CalSTRS, when we look at our work in partnership with other institutional investors around the world. Um, this is about changing um, you know, corporate culture, it's about changing uh, corporate behavior, uh, but more importantly, it's about those commitments that these companies are gonna be able to make. And I will say that uh, in our uh, initiative, uh, Climate Action 100 Plus, where we have um, about 700 investors that are uh, engaging with the 160 top uh, emitters in the world, uh, which includes Exxon, by the way. Um, we are seeing um, commitments being made in terms of emissions reduction, significant uh, commitments being made. Uh, but it takes that kind of, um, you know, that kind of muscle to really get uh, companies to move on a, on a global basis. And we're going we're gonna to see kind of this, um, you know, short-term, long-term kind of uh, dichotomy along the, the journey. Uh, that's inevitable. But what we uh, do need to continue to do is to stay the course. Um, and certainly what I'm excited about, and particularly uh, with many of you here in this room, is um, as we see new technologies, as we see from my vantage point as a pension fund trustee, you know, new products that uh, really can be um, places where we place our assets. When I see that uh, we're, we're uh, corporate um, uh, board uh, behavior and competencies are changing, you know, the fact that we were able to, uh, through our proxy vote to get um, you know, new directors on the Exxon board to think about uh, a renewable energy future. I mean, these are the kinds of things that need to continue to happen. And I don't think they're at odds with one another, uh, but uh, it is also just about how we continue on this journey, but also acknowledge the realities that we continue to have to address every day. Anything to add, Alma or anyone else? Well, I would say there are two other proposals that we're monitoring as well from the SEC that could impact funds. So one would require um, a fund's investment strategy to essentially match its name. So 80% of its assets would have to be aligned with the strategy that the name indicates. So if it's an ESG-focused fund, then 80% of its assets should be in ESG-related investments. So I think that's, that's one thing that we're monitoring. And the other would be additional disclosures for funds as well. So they would have to disclose the greenhouse gas emissions of their portfolios, along with other ESG-related disclosures, um, such as how they engage with companies on ESG strategies. So that's a proposal that we think could impact investors, funds, and also the public companies themselves, since the disclosures would filter through into the reporting. Well, the last question I'll leave uh, just as a suggestion, since we're running out of time here, it's for uh, you, controller. Mm -hmm. uh, would it make sense to track reforms on ESG investments relative to others to make the case for increased investment in ESG? I, I think we will get to that point. Um, and as we are looking to uh, integrate this in all of our asset classes, I, and as we get uh, better reporting, better metrics, I think we will uh, get to that point to where we can have that uh, data really drive um, additional investments in a way that is going to hopefully accelerate uh, our ability to get to net zero. Um, the one thing I, th that we haven't talked a lot about, but I do want to just inject before our time is up, and, that, and I opened with this, and that is the S and ESG. I think we've been so focused on the E, uh, but the S is really about how we also, in this unique transformation with respect to our energy sector, um, be able to also deliver value to um, the communities um, that our companies serve and also being sure that we aren't leaving no one behind in this energy transition as well. So um, I don't know that I can feel um, really good about leaving the stage without at least saying that. <laughs> so. Well, that's a fitting close to a very insightful discussion. And you know, to have our state controller here uh, speaking about these very important issues, it, it was an honor. We really appreciate it. And to have our corporate leaders, NASDAQ, HP, Western Digital, showing what this new era of leadership looks like in Silicon Valley here in the flesh was greatly appreciated. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Tim McRae, the Senior Vice President for Energy and Environment at the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. With the impact of a changing climate, hundreds of thousands of Bay Area residents are directly in harm's way. 
It's why immediate action needs to be taken to fund wetlands restoration. In 2016, SVLG co-led the campaign for Measure AA. It was overwhelmingly supported by Bay Area voters across nine counties. This regional funding measure raises $25 million a year to protect this vital natural resource. To get an expert perspective on the situation, I met up with Michelle Orr here at the Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge. Hi, good to see you. How are you doing? Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, likewise. You want to take a walk? Yeah. All right. I wanted to hear from her what needs to be done to fix this problem and what will happen if we do nothing. Beautiful day today. It's gorgeous. It's great to be here. What is the importance of restoring wetlands in San Francisco Bay? So wetlands are where the land meets the sea and they support thousands of aquatic and terrestrial species. Like those geese right over there. <laughs> yes, those are not native, but yes, they do. They love it. Um, they support our fisheries. They support waterfowl and shorebirds. This is a key stop on the Pacific Flyway. And then also providing flood protection to adjacent areas, water quality improvements, and then just beautiful open spaces that people can enjoy and watch nature, go for a run. What's the history of restoring wetlands in this area? Beginning in the gold rush, people came into this area and really the bay was treated as a place to dump your trash or to, to fill in and build roads and houses on top of. And over the course of about 100 years, we managed to lose 90% of our natural wetlands. A group of people got together in the 60s and said, that's enough. And uh, this area was the first in the nation to pass a Coastal Protection Act that stopped wetland fill. And so this area has been a leader. And then in the 80s, 90s, and since then, we have um, started to be able to recover some of these historic values. Some goals were set to bring back 100,000 acres of wetlands, and we knew we needed funding to get there. In 2016, the Bay Area voters passed Measure AA. Yeah, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group co-led that campaign. Thank you so much, yeah. It was just great to have that 70% support. I mean, it's incredible. People recognize the value of these places. So what happens if we don't build more wetlands? We don't build more wetlands, well, we, we don't get any of those benefits. We don't recover our, our commercial fisheries, our endangered species. And then the wetlands themselves help reduce water levels. It reduces flooding in those developed areas and sequester carbon from the atmosphere and so help reduce um, global warming. <coughs> Well, thanks so much for your time. This has been a lot of fun, and uh, thank you so much for your work, and look forward to continue working with you. It has been a great time. It's been really fun to talk to you. Likewise. A big thank you to Michelle Orr, Wetlands and Estuaries Director for Environmental Science Associates, for her insightful thoughts. But the numbers are clear. When it comes to flooding, San Francisco Bay Area has tens of billions of dollars of assets directly at risk. We need at least $1.5 billion to complete the most critical projects in our region. So we're asking the state and federal governments to match what we've raised locally. The sooner we can restore wetlands, the greater chance they will be resilient in the face of rising sea levels. And most important, it's necessary to avoid flooding our shores and impacting our communities and companies for years to come. Our next panel today is Greener CCAs and the California Models Lessons. Our first panelist is Jan Pepper, CEO of Peninsula Clean Energy. Please welcome her to the stage. Next up is Monica Padilla, Chief Operating Officer and Director of Power Resources of Silicon Valley Clean Energy. And next is Zach Strike, Chief Operating Officer of San Jose Clean Energy. And finally, our moderator, direct from his work on the wetlands, is SVLG's Tim McRae, Senior Vice President Climate. Wonderful. 
So Silicon Valley Leadership Group has featured panels on community choice aggregation, or CCAs, in two previous energy and sustainability summits as the movement towards CCAs was spreading across California. The, that movement has now matured, and today we're highlighting three local CCAs and showcasing what they are due that is cutting edge to advance clean energy goals here in Silicon Valley. So thank you all for being available to do this today. I'm going to start with Jan. So Jan, Peninsula Clean Energy has set a goal of providing 100% renewable energy during all hours of the day, 24-7, by 2025. How did you set this goal, and why 2025? OK. Well, thank you all for being here, first of all. And uh, it's great to see you here. And it's really fun to be here with my colleagues and with Tim. Um, so since our inception in 2016, we've pushed the boundaries in clean energy procurement and deployment to significantly accelerate the state's goals. And in 2016, when we started, we were delivering 50% renewable energy to our customers, which was 14 years ahead of California's then goal of 50% renewable by 2030. And in 2017, we adopted the goal to be 100% renewable on a 24-7 basis by 2025. And the whole reason for this is to reduce the demand signal for uh, fossil fuels from the grid. And also, since we started, our rates have been 5% below PG&E's rates, and we've saved our customers $90 million over that time. So we've shown that you can, <laughs> you can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and you can save customers money at the same time. So even if someone doesn't prioritize receiving cleaner electricity, everyone wants to save money. And so we believe in order to have widespread adoption of clean energy, it needs to be either less expensive or at parity with alternative, uh, dirtier alternatives. So why 2025? At the time when we said it in 2017, it seemed like it was very far away. And we always want to push ourselves to, um, to meet our goals, and so our, we're, we're doing it. And our power resources team is doing extensive modeling, both deterministic and stochastic modeling of different portfolio options to figure out how we can do this by 2025. And our preliminary results, which we're going to be uh, publishing later this summer, is that it looks like it is possible to cost-effectively deliver close to 24-7, 100% renewables, um, on a 24-7 on a basis and have it be less expensive. So stay tuned. Um, we'll be sharing our results this summer. And um, also the model that we've built is uh, we are going to share with anyone who's interested. That's wonderful. Are there technical challenges to achieving this goal? Um, yes, there are. And actually, the, if we can put the, the heat map slide up. Um, so the, right here, yeah. So this is a heat map here on the right. Uh, my right, your left, I guess. And on the bottom, it shows uh, the months of the year, the days of the year, and on the vertical axis, it shows the 24 hours of the day. So basically, there's 8,760 points in that heat map representing every hour of every day. And the, uh, the goal is to have this heat map be all green. And what this shows for 2020, where we're delivering 50% renewable, is that we're about... Um, I think in this, in this heat map, we're about 52% renewable for every hour of every day. And um, the, the yellow, orange, and red gradations show more and more emissions in certain hours. So this is the goal to make that whole thing green. Are there policy barriers to achieve this goal? And to both the policy barriers and the technical barriers, how are you going to overcome those barriers? Yeah, well, and let me go over here, too. I okay. forgot this part, too. So this is how we do it. Um, the, uh, the dotted line, the dotted black line there, and this is hours of the day along the bottom, uh, megawatts on the vertical axis, um, shows that's our current load, that dotted line. And then we show the different resources that we're procuring to meet our load, because we need to have the supply match the load every hour of every day. We have base load geothermal in the red, hydro in the light blue. Uh, the dark blue is wind. The yellow is solar. And then there's some production from the solar that's above the line. Some of that we're going to be uh, putting into battery storage in that green lined area and then 
uh, using that stored energy in the shoulder hours there in the evening and the morning to not have to purchase any grid energy during those hours. And then also using demand response to, to uh, load shift and load shape to bring the, the load up more in the afternoon when there's a lot of solar that's available and to try to bring it down in the evening when there's the peak. So th that's how we're, the other part of it. So the, the policy barriers that you asked about, um, there's just some things going on in, in the market right now. There are supply chain issues driving storage prices up. There was the, um, the Department of Commerce solar anti-circumvention -circumve investigation, which fortunately <coughs> has been, uh, basically has a two-year stay on it, but that's been uh, a disruption in the solar market. Um, we need more options in terms of energy storage. We need other tech types of technologies besides lithium ion so that we have more choices and hopefully the prices will also go down. And then we also need to hourly track renewable energy. Right now we track it on a monthly basis. We need to track that on an hourly basis. And Regis, which is the agency in the, in the state that tracks renewable energy, is uh, moving t towards hourly tracking. They've contracted with a company called MRETS that will allow us to do that. So then we'll be able to report out on that and actually, SB 1158, which is currently being considered uh, in the California legislature, will allow for all entities to start reporting in a few years on an hourly basis. That's great. So I know that PCE wants to contribute to San Mateo County becoming greenhouse gas free by 2025. Are there technical and pol policy barriers to those goals? Right. So our goal is to, uh, to meet the state's goals to be 100% GHG free by 2035 in the transportation and the building sectors. So we are working on, um, on that. We have a number of programs going on to electrify transportation to, and to electrify buildings. Okay, I'm gonna uh, bring in Monica. Sure. And Monica is the CEO of <coughs> Silicon Valley Clean Energy. And you guys had an exciting announcement yesterday with Google. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, well, first of all, shout out to anyone out there who's from Google. Um, it was a pleasure actually putting this deal together with Google staff. We've been working on it for, I would say, almost three years, if not longer. And so we're very honored for Google to have selected us as their partner in achieving their, their carbon-free goals. So um, unfortunately, I can't talk a lot about the details of the, of the arrangement. But in general, what we put together is a 10-year contract with Google where we will help them achieve their carbon-free energy uh, goals. So Google has in their portfolio some resources and some behind-the-meter resources. So we'll take their load needs on an hourly basis and see how we can optimize their resources along with our resources to deliver a carbon-free 24 by 7 portfolio. So another 24 by 7. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and, and so how does that compare, uh, if at all, to, to what Jan just talked about with Peninsula Clean Energy? Right, right. So Google has their own metric, and it's called a CFV. So their 92% goal, essentially, is to have 92% of their hours covered with carbon-free electricity. So they're not, their goal is not to get to 24 by 7 carbon-free, but rather to make sure that those hours, 92% of the hours, are covered. Now, SVCE ourselves, we don't have a 24 by 7 goal like uh, PCE does by 2025. Uh, we have what we believe a very good head start to get there. In fact, based on our own projections, by 2025, we'll already be 80% covered. Um, that is that 80% of our hours will be covered with carbon-free energy. So our, our goal here is really to learn through this Google, Google um, arrangement rather than set a goal ourselves. We've been talking with our board and our community about what our pathway to 2045 might look like. We believe that there is a pathway to 24 by 7, but we don't know if we're going to get there by 2025, 2030, or 2045. I think for us, it's really important to do incremental steps and to learn from those steps, understand what the grid impacts are, whether we could maintain a certain level of reliability, what the affordability metrics are to getting to 24 by 7, and to really learn through one customer or one large customer at a time like Google. They're one of our largest customers in SVC service territory. So we hope to learn 
how we can actually deploy it, really learn how we can use some of their resources behind the meter, because Google has a very extensive uh, portfolio of, of batteries and electric vehicles and solar. So s understand how we can deploy their resources behind the meter to really get those, like Jan put up on the graph, those, those parts where it's hard to get long-term resources to meet those hours, see how we can deploy what we call virtual power plants. So ours is a more, I think, incremental report, approach to 24 by 7 than PCEs is. We think we will get there. Uh, we just want to do it in a more, uh, I think, incremental way. Got it. And you anticipated one of my questions, which is how much does this agreement rely on behind the meter resources? That is something that we're still trying to understand. So some of Google's load is still under development. You know, they have some new construction they're doing in our service territory. We have a forecast of what we think it's going to be, but we're thinking somewhere between the 5 to 10 percent range. So a lot of it will depend on conventional supply. Uh, we have been working with them to show them what a portfolio of 24 by 7 carbon-free resources might be, which includes uh, solar, solar with storage, uh, wind, and geothermal. And so we have a sense of how much utility-scale renewables will have to procure on their behalf in order to get to 24 by 7. But, and that's the easy part. I mean, I'm not going to say easy because there's a lot of challenges right now to buying in the market, believe me. But, that, but putting in place a large-scale contract to meet a large majority of their 24 by 7 needs, that's the easy part. The hard part is to get those hours where the sun doesn't shine and you've already deployed your batteries or the wind's not blowing or in, if you have geothermal, if it's just not enough. Got it. Now, I understand that SVCE was instrumental in the formation of a, a new joint powers authority. Uh, this is separate from the Google stuff, uh, comprised of several CCAs to procure large-scale resources to achieve economies of scale and share in risk. And I know that you worked on that. Can you share us with us a little bit about that? Yeah, so California Community Power is what we call our super JPA, or J super joint powers authority. It's made up of 10 CCAs, or community choice aggregators, located mostly in Northern California. It includes Silicon Valley Clean Energy, San Jose Clean Energy, Peninsula Clean Energy, Marin Clean Energy, Redwood Coast Energy Authority, Sonoma Clean Power, uh, San Francisco Community Power, and Valley Clean Energy. And so we range in sizes, um, with Valley Clean Energy and Redwood Coast Energy Authority being very small. And then with um, East Bay, also one of the members uh, being very large, and San Jose also being large, and Central Coast Community Energy, another uh, member also being large. So we came together to really see if, if joint procurement could work to, to meet certain procurement needs that we had that it didn't make sense for us to individually go out and seek. And so really it was somewhat prompt, we, although we had been thinking about it for a long time, many of us, including uh, Jan here, come from municipal utilities where joint power uh, or joint procurement is very common. Uh, we had been thinking about it for a while because we're all doing essentially the same kind of procurement to some extent. And when we were developing the 2020 Integrated Resource Plan, that's a, a report that is re required by the state of California, CPUC, there was very, very strong hints that they would be ordering a procurement mandate for long duration storage. And long duration storage is just like regular storage, although it has to be discharged over an eight hour period, which is really hard to come by. There wasn't a lot of that in the market, nobody was buying it. Most of us were buying shorter term storage with our solar. And so we thought, well, how are we going to do this? And what is this mandate going to look like? And some of us are going to have to buy you know, five megawatts, and some of us are going to have to buy 40 megawatts. Doesn't make sense. So we kicked it into high gear, and CC Power actually formed while we were also in the process of doing uh, the solicitations for long duration storage. And so uh, we seated the board for CC Power, I believe, in February 2021. Is that right? You're on the board. It was 2021, right? Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, last year. <laughs> and then um, we continued our solicitation processes. Uh, we've done two major solicitations, and through those efforts, we've signed four contracts, including two for long duration storage. So the CCAs that participated in that um, are going to meet their procurement order requirements under the midterm reliability procurement order that CPUC put out in June of 2021. And then we just recently, with the uh, direction of San Jose Clean Energy, uh, Jean Soleil, I know you're out there, uh, put together, assigned two geothermal contracts, two new geothermal contracts that'll come online in 2025 timeframe. 
And so between those four procurement efforts, the CCAs that participated essentially have been able to meet their whole procurement requirements under the mandate in a very cost-effective way. And so that was the goal of CC Power, and we quickly uh, realized that goal. That's exciting. And do you think this is a model for other CCAs throughout the state? Joint procurement in general, I think, is a model for other CCAs, whether it's through the structure that we put together um, or through just getting together with your counterparts and, and peers and doing joint procurement. At SBCE, we've issued three solicitations since we started for, for, to meet our renewable requirements under RPS, SB350 and SB100. And we've done them all in conjunction with Central Coast Community Energy. We find that going out together to buy a large uh, portion of uh, renewable resources uh, gets us economies. It helps us reduce costs associated with negotiating, signing, and, and evaluating resources. And then it helps us share the risk uh, because these projects all have risk, whether it's development risk, performance risk, or any other risk. By sharing in resources and being able to sign more contracts, we kind of diversify that risk through, through multiple agencies. That makes a lot of sense. All right, so I'll pull in Zach now. Zach Strike from San Jose Clean Energy. Um, San Jose Clean Energy now offers renewable energy from your innovative Kern County Solar and Battery Storage Project. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yes, the, uh, so that project um, came online late last year um, and developed by uh, Terragen, very um, you know, trusted uh, and innovative developer. And we, um, uh, what's neat about it is that it is, um, it's a firm uh, amount of energy. So if we can put the slides up, I think we, yeah, there on, on that side. Um, so we're getting a firm 62 megawatts of clean energy for 16 hours a day from six in the morning until 10 at night. Uh, and in order to do that, as you can see the numbers there, they needed to build more solar than 62 megawatts and a bunch of batteries um, to, to, to offer that. But um, the, the benefits there you know, are, are obvious that you're not, the performance risk is taken off the table. And so that helps with the morning peak, which can get a little expensive and particularly the late afternoon and, uh, and early evening. Um, so we've been um, really happy with that and, um, yeah, pleased with the, the creativity um, of the developer. And, um, you know, we, we hope to do similar sorts of projects uh, going forward. And what went into your decision to be an off-taker for this project? And are there unique features to the relationship between you and the developer? I would say, I mean, the, um, it was a, a novel structure and we thought that that was, that that was um, you know, worth exploring. and. and you know, sort of showing the way and maybe, you know, perhaps making a market for, for other such structures. Um, different uh, members in our um, team had experience with Terragen as a, you know, as a developer and, you know, the fine relationship in the, uh, in the business. So um, really just compelling economics and um, the novel structure. I think I should have mentioned maybe that, that that amount of energy, just to help those of you that don't do this all the time, that's about 68,000, I believe, um, homes in San Jose that that, that covers 24-7. You know, so. That's great. So SJCE's forthcoming green tariffs for commercial customers called direct renewables will include an hourly renewables project <laughs> product going to 100% in coming years. So when do you aim to offer this to, for, to customers? Yeah, so um, I, should, I should say that's, we expect that that will be one of the structures that, okay. that, that is offered. Um, that's, you know, we, we respond to what customers want. Um, we've, we've heard really clearly from, from at least one customer that that, that sort of um, uh, product is, is interesting to them. Um, I'll take a moment to, to plug the um, amazing uh, cooperation and collaboration uh, in the CCA community. And so we learned from those that have come before us. We, we launched in... You know, in earnest, we launched in early 2019, a little bit behind uh, Peninsula and, and Silicon Valley Clean Energy, and so we've we've learned a lot from them, and and uh, you know, the uh, information sharing about what structures or you know how to think about things or what might work um, has been really uh, fantastic. Um, but so we imagine, you know, um, the load is coming, uh, and so um, for example, one 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 customer. Let's get going. What do you think you can do you know, in year 20, 2024, 2025? Um, what does the hourly look like that? And then you know, with a ramp towards, a ramp towards 100% over time, and, and not too much time, uh, because um, 
you know, San Jose has a, I'm jumping around here a little bit, but San Jose has a, um, has a carbon free by, excuse me, carbon neutral by 2030 um, aspiration. And that was just uh, formally uh, signed off on, approved at city council last Tuesday. Yeah, I was, I'll, I'll stay on the, the, yeah, the let's green turf, but yeah. I will get to that in a sec. So uh, are there decisions that have to be made before we get to you guys? Yeah, very much so. So, so um, what, are the, what are they? Yeah, so city council, you know, we have, we have standard products, we have three offerings now. Anything beyond that, we need to go to city council for approval to do so. And so um, today it's, it's large customers that have expressed interest in, in, in this kind of, you know, call it bespoke or custom product or direct renewables. And so when we say direct renewables, what that is alluding to is that, you know, um, and, and often um, corporate buyers want to show additionality, right? So new construction, a new power plant that in part or, or altogether is, is delivering energy to their site or is bought for them. It doesn't actually, the electrons don't necessarily go to their, to their system. But so um, it would be, that, so that, that additionality, um, so we would uh, be, we would need to understand what those costs are. So we would, as, as has been alluded to here, the market's a little silly right now, and so um, a little hard to price. What would we, um, you know, what that offering looks like? Are today's prices the right ones to think about, or you, know, you sort of let things settle down for a little bit? So, understanding, you know, doing a formal cost of service study, um, and you know that amount of renewables plus whatever we're going to need to fill in, as Monica talked about, um, plus our, you know, sort of admin costs and scheduling the power and all that, go, all that goes into the rate. And that would all need to be, you know, signed off on by council, and probably we'd do a pilot, one or two customers. Maybe there's a couple different flavors. See how that goes before we expand it. And so I assume that you don't yet know what the cost will be, or if there's a premium over or above what people are already paying. Um, that's right. We don't. Yes, I mean, the, we don't yet know what the cost will be. However, um, I think, um, I mean, one of the reasons that um, some uh, customers have approached us about this is that the belief that if they commit longer term. Um, you know, a 10-year contract, for example, that, that the renewables, um, you know, the premium should be lower than what we have on our current 100% product and maybe even, maybe even cheaper. So the, the trade, the, the price, the extra price is the commitment. The CCA model today, as many of you know, is, is that it's month to month, <coughs> and that's really been, you know, really nice flexibility, particularly when you launch and what is this whole CCA thing, um, but it, it <coughs> makes it a little hard to, to plan a business in that you don't you know, a big customer could leave tomorrow, so. So I want to get back to your support of Cal San Jose's goals. So San Jose Clean Energy, part of the city of San Jose, and supporting the city of San Jose's climate smart San Jose goals, a goal of carbon neutrality for, by the city of, by, for the city by 2030. Um, what does that mean for electric vehicles? Are you making investments to electrify transportation and options now? Um, we are. If I we could have the slide back, I think we have one on that. Yeah, so um, as, as, you know, it's no secret, the, the big sources of emissions are um, our power, the power that we supply, buildings and then transportation. And um, the, the move, what we think it will take to get to um, uh, carbon, carbon neutral by 2030 is that 90% of the vehicles on the road, not 90% of new registrations, 90% of the vehicles on the road <clears throat> will need to be electric vehicles. That's uh, 83,000 a year uh, between now and then. So wow. um, ambitious, yeah, yeah, it's up and to the right. Um, so, you know, what we're doing, uh, we're, you know, an example of something we've done already, collaborating with um, our partners here on the stage, in addition to the city of Palo Alto and um, the city of Santa Clara, Silicon Valley Power, we applied for and, and um, to, to the California EVIP, the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program um, from the CEC. Uh, and so for San Jose, that meant $14 million that is going into to new charging, you know, right now. Um, that's increasing our, um, I want to say it's doubling the infrastructure, but it's not nearly enough what we need. We need, again, to hit that number, 7,500 um, chargers installed. Um, so it's a lot of chargers uh, between now and then. That is a lot of chargers. And I'll, I'll pull into your, your, your colleagues on this one, too. Are you folks making similar investments for transportation electrification? Right, we're, we're part of that Cal EVIP program as well. So we have invested 16 million of our own funds and we received a grant from the Energy Commission of 12 million. So we've got 28 million for us to put in 3,500 chargers by 2024. So we're 
working diligently on that. That's great. Um, the other issue, obviously, transportation and buildings. So what are you folks doing on buildings? I'll have Zach start, and then if, you have, if others want to join in, join in there, too. The, um, so as, uh, as you said, Tim, we are a department of the city of San Jose, so a little bit different uh, model than uh, many of the other CCAs. But um, this climate smart plan is a citywide thing. It's actually quarterbacked by um, a different department. Um, but so you know, it's sort of all hands on deck. So um, a big part of the um, building electrification is that we enacted a city council, enacted a, um, a natural gas prohibition on new construction last year. Um, that is a, a great step, but the existing building electrification is a massive undertaking that needs to come. Um, I think that means in order to get 100% of our stock done, that's like 43,000 buildings a year that need to be um, uh, fully electrified. It's a lot. Um, and so the big buckets that, you know, our analysis and, you know, working with consultants, the, the, the big, um, it's not low hanging fruit, but the big buckets are, are water and space heating. And so doing as much as we can to um, get the word out about what supports out there to help build um, contractor capacity, because as anyone who has tried to do this in your own home knows, the, it, this is new, and the, the people that you call generally don't, they try to talk you out of it, or they're not ready, it's expensive. Grid, um, distribution grid upgrades are needed, but maybe not as much as um, people think, and, and um, so sequencing it the right way. Um, I know you asked about building electrification, but the, having people not charge at home, not have to you know, upgrade a panel to have home charging, and so we, I think, um, have an opportunity just with pricing um, and potentially um, doing some ownership of vehicle charging to really push people to charge during the day. So um, the last thing I'll say is that we, um, what we heard from uh, residents that we, there was an extensive um, you know, sort of outreach on what does the city want um, in this electrification. Um, people, what people want is not to have it done to them. Uh, they want to be part of this. They want it to work for them. And so it's gonna mean in San Jose, we have approximately 80,000 customers on um, income uh, limited um, reduced discount rates. It's about a quarter of our population, and there's probably another 20, 25% who are probably, you know, or who are also thought of as low income, just don't qualify for those rates. And so they're going to need help to, uh, to make this transition. Um, and uh, they also want to be part of, you know, the jobs. We don't want to parachute in a bunch of people. These need to be, you know, jobs created in our community. Sorry, I've said a lot. Okay, Monica or Jen, did you want to jump in on what you're doing for buildings as well? Yeah, I'll jump in on that. Um, we're working with Silicon Valley Clean Energy and maybe San Jose on what we call REACH codes. So every three years, every city adopts new building codes that the state puts forth, like for safety, earthquakes, whatever. And so a REACH code reaches beyond what the state is advocating. And so we've been working with our municipalities to adopt codes for new construction, as Zach noted, that doesn't use natural gas. So, so any new construction might, uh, might have to have heat pump water heaters or heat uh, non-gas based uh, space heating, also electric induction cooking for new construction. So in our territory, we represent 21 jurisdictions and right now 17 of our jurisdictions have adopted these REACH codes and uh, the next round of building codes is, is happening as well. There's some other things that, um, I mean, the big lift, though, is existing buildings. So if you have your own home, you don't want someone telling you, well, you got you to gotta yank out your gas heater and your gas water heater. That's a lot of money. So, um, you know, just we're looking at um, burnout um, ordinances where if when your appliance does burn out, when you need to replace it, to replace it with an electric alternative. And also one of our jurisdictions is looking at an end of flow ordinance, basically specifying the year when natural gas needs, natural gas service needs to be shut down in the community. So our, the city of Half Moon Bay has designated 2045 as the end of flow date for their community. And Monica, did you want to add anything quickly on what <coughs> SBC? I would just doing? say we're doing very much the same thing that San Jose. I think the one thing to point out is that uh, CCAs with the reach codes and other things that we're doing with our municipal cities, it's possible because the CCAs were represented by, by each of the cities. Our boards are made up of our elected officials, 
from each of the cities, and they are very much our partner with their cities in getting these reach codes adopted. That's great. So we've got about eight minutes. I'm going to try to incorporate as many of the audience questions as I've received here. So I'll start with um, one for each of you, which is what role do distributed energy resources play in your strategy to provide carbon-free service to your customers? Are you self-providing? What role does distributed energy play? Yeah, distributed energy resources. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're certainly working with our customers and, and actually with our jurisdictions to put in uh, distributed resources, which to us is local behind the meter resources. So we're actually working with, I think, 14 of our jurisdictions to put solar and solar plus storage on municipal buildings in order to reduce their costs and to reduce their, um, to help them meet their climate action plans. And then also to add resiliency to the city so that if the power goes out, they have uh, storage to have clean energy backup when, um, when that's needed. Yeah, same. We just recently had a ribbon cutting with the city of Milpitas at their senior community center where we help fund a resiliency project there so that they can have cool air even during these PSPS events. I mean, in addition to that, uh, we have a plans to deploy what we call virtual power plants, which is where we're, rather than buying utility scale resources, we'll invest in our uh, customers for them to put solar storage, other types of measures behind the meter, and figure out a way where we could send them price signals for them to reduce their energy use or ship their energy use so that it makes sense on an economic and emission standpoint for both of us. Uh, again, Google is a very big test case for us on how we can actually deploy that in a very cost-effective and effective way as well. And so definitely going to be a very big part of our, uh, our portfolio mix. Um, similar sorts of things. Um, and I would just add that uh, customer demand response programs, um, we're, we're optimistic that those can be a big part of um, the future too and um, you know, pretty inexpensively um, reduce demand at key, key times. So another question comes to the audience about a particularly uh, hot political topic in Sacramento. There's a proposal, SB 1020, which is uh, by Senator Laird and which is part of uh, the climate package that was put forward by Senate leadership, which would include as a piece of it central procurement through the State of Water, Department of Water Resources. So uh, do CCAs have a particular take on doing central procurement through the State Department of Water Resources? And if you don't, you don't. But I, I thought I would be willing to, uh, to, to ask the question. I think we prefer to buy our own resources. We know what our customers need. We know what our portfolio is made up of. I think our formation of CC Power is one demonstration how we can come together and do joint procurement on a large scale if we had to as well. Um, you know, that said, there are certain resources that are very complicated for us to procure, even as individuals and even collectively. And if it makes sense, then, you know, it makes sense, but our preference is to have our local communities dictate what we buy. That's Ditto. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so how do your renewable procurement plans impact grid reliability? So, uh, well, I'll, I'll take that. Sure. Yeah, so some people, and you can add to it, some people are, are concerned that the intermittency of renewables like solar and wind will cause problems with the grid, but um, that's actually not the case. And there have been some studies by the California Energy Commission showing that grid reliability will be the same, if not even slightly better, once we have even more renewables out there. So um, that, that's a scare tactic that's not, not, that's not real. You know, we, we certainly are meeting and are serious about meeting our regulatory requirements for grid reliability, for resource adequacy, and all the other complications that go along with that. And um, we can do that with renewables. I don't know if you have more to add for that. Yeah, I think since, <clears throat> since we started, um, we have set a, essentially a, a goal for ourselves, and our board has been there with us all the way th that Anytime we put solar on the grid, because solar, there's an abundance of it, but obviously it doesn't shine all the time, and we all know about the duck curve and the issues with overgeneration. Every single one of our solar projects, with the exception of one, has been paired with storage, because we think that's the right thing to do. We think that it makes sense for us to have that capacity to shift 
energy <clears throat> during the, the high producing hours into the evening. Um, so that's been a part of our, essential, our, our DNA since the beginning. Whether, uh, whether the state ordered it or didn't order it, we believe it's the right thing to do if you're gonna put, deploy that amount of solar on the grid. Uh, because when and if we do have a reliability crisis, I think that storage um, and having a lot of storage on the grid will definitely help make that less and less of an event in the future. I would just add the um, uh, allowing more renewable resources on the grid would be um, would help grid reliability. And so, you know, anything that could be done uh, with interconnections and um, tra at the transmission level and grid gr grid upgrades that are needed, you know, at the distribution level in order to allow um, those renewables to flow, that 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 would be uh, helpful. Another question from the audience. How can a CCA invest profits into the community to advance environmental and climate literacy so that the public understands the importance of what the CCAs are doing in particularly partnering with uh, K-12 schools? That's a great question. We have that, and we have that answer. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing that. We've been working, uh, Prince of Clean Energy serves San Mateo County, which is where we are right now. And we've been working with the San Mateo County Office of Education to um, work with, we have a few different programs that we're doing with them. One of them is working with teachers. So in the summertime when they're, um, when they're off, they can work with us to develop curriculum for um, their students to introduce energy topics uh, in the next year. And so we've been, been doing that for a few years. We also have a program with ninth to 11th graders called the Youth Ambassador Program where they do uh, projects together and do projects for their schools to um, increase the, uh, the environmental sustainability of their, of their schools. And I think last, last, this last year we had, I don't know, 50 or 75 students in the cohort. And it's really, it's really so fun to be working with the high school students because they have so much energy uh, literal energy, and uh, they're just so excited, and they are the ones that are going to need to carry this forward. So it's great that they're interested, and um, we think, yeah, literacy in the schools is super, super important. And then I'll just ask this as a last question to each of you. Are there any energy market breakthroughs that could really help achieve, you the, achieve the goals that you're setting? Are you dependent on, say, offshore wind permitting or breakthroughs in storage or renewables from out of state? And I'll just go really quickly for each of you. So Zach, I'm gonna put you on the spot and then I'll um, just go down the line. The, uh, the, the, the shape of the delivery from offshore wind would really be nice um, with solar. So that nice compliment. Monica? Nothing innovative, just more transmission, because that's what we need. We need to be able to bring wind from out of state and, and develop projects in state that are reliable as well. And Jen? Yeah, I mean, same as what, what Zach and Monica said. We are looking at out-of-state out wind because the, um, the supply profile of those projects complements what we have in California. We, plus, because it's kind of on a different time zone, it additionally helps to um, provide resources when we need them. All right, that was our panel. Thank you so much for coming today, and thank you from the, from the crowd. There are lots of great events coming up at SVLG, including the Women's Summit, our racial justice and equity event, Moment or Momentum, and SVLG's signature event of the Fall Annual Forum. To learn how you can be a part of it as a sponsor or a guest, contact us at events at svlg.org. But now, our final talk today is Restoring While Rebuilding. The Biden administration addresses unequal environments. Martha Guzman Aceves, Region 9 Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency. And Martha is in conversation with Rick Callender, CEO, Valley Water. Rick, come on up. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to be here today. Always good to see uh, people live. Looking forward to this uh, conversation, truly. So President Biden, one of the things I was really excited about is when he got into office, one of the things that he did is put into place the Justice 40 initiative. So I was really uh, excited to see that occur and that there was going to be a, a focus on environmental justice. But when I saw you come to EPA, I was also very excited about that as well. I worked with you at the governor's office. I'd seen what your history is. You really had a heart 
for environmental justice. And so I said, this is really a tough time to go into EPA. Well, why did you decide to do it? Um, well, thank you for the compliment, Rick. It's good to be acknowledged by a colleague that has, I have mutual respect for. Uh, I did it for the reason you said, you know, um, this Monday we have a federal holiday for June 19th, Juneteenth. And this president made that happen, I think, you know, first uh, few months in office. Uh, I got to hear a little bit of uh, Betty Yee's panel, and she said in her closing remarks, we can't forget the S. And that's really why I did it, because we know the environment is also about the S, the social issues. So Justice 40, which is basically the commitment of the administration that all of the investments, particularly the bipartisan infrastructure law, be invested, at least 40% of those be invested in the underserved disadvantaged communities. And of course, at EPA, we have fortunately much, much bigger investments uh, that we're shooting for in our programs. I know, Rick, you're familiar with our clean water and drinking water funds. Exactly. Those have a 49% threshold for disadvantaged communities, um, just as an example. So I definitely uh, you know, was part of the administration vision of equity, of social justice, of racial justice, and having that support from the top I, you know, we know working in chains of command that having it coming from the top and doing this kind of work, it's so helpful to have that be a vision and a priority. Indeed, indeed. And I think, like I said, you, they got the right woman to do it. Um, we, we're talking, just when I opened, I was talking about the, the administration's focus on climate justice and putting into place uh, environmental justice. And the Biden administration and the EPA have put environmental justice at the center of climate action, as you uh, just acknowledged, and having the leadership from the top. We, what do you believe are the greatest progress, have been the greatest progress in addressing environmental justice as it's occurred in Region 9? Yeah, you know, one of the uh, things that I, the, the structure of many of the federal agencies is that much of the rulemaking happens in what we call the headquarters offices, and the regions are really implementing and enforcing. And so I, I would say, the biggest opportunity that's happened is actually what the rulemaking is coming out of DC, which is particularly on our biggest sources of pollution, heavy duty trucks being one of the most important ones right now. You know, in our communities, environmental justice here in the Bay Area, the ports of Oakland, much of our uh, freight corridors, you all know the South Coast areas, the San Joaquin, the heavy duty vehicles are the largest source of pollution and the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. People were talking about that earlier, about transportation being that number one sector. And we have a rulemaking to make sure we're getting to, hopefully, 100% zero. It's all gonna be a matter of your leadership, actually, in making sure we have enough of the, uh, we have the facts, but we need enough of that support to get to um, you know, zero emission vehicles. So the heavy duty fleet will have a rulemaking for the 2030 model year, and the president uh, directed us to get that done by the next, uh, next year, end of next year. So um, that's a big one, having the focus on really tackling those large sources of pollution, like transportation, is uh, probably the, the biggest thing. Now, on, on the implementation and enforcement side, we've had to repeal a lot of the harm from the last administration, including everything from being able to, uh, if, if a company is exceeding their emissions locally, making sure they're remediating that immediately and also investing in that local community for um, you know, solutions that are immediately felt. And a lot of that was tied up from the last administration and we're still unwinding it. I taught, had a briefing yesterday on another memo that needs to be unwinded in order to have better enforcement. Yeah. Um, one of the things I know about your history is you, you were always on the front lines. You were always engaging in the community. You were one of the folks that were really working with the communities. I saw you do it at the governor's office. If you look at your, even your history and your work history, uh, working with farm workers and others, you've been on the front lines. What are you hearing um, when you're engaging with the front line communities? Uh, what are they sharing as uh, for as priority actions to advance environmental justice? What, what do you, what's the call from the community? You know, one of the most basic things is 
looking at government as a whole, local government, regional government, federal government, state government, tribal government, and asking that we work together, that we come to the community with, particularly the communities that have cumulative impacts, that we do our job as government, you know, us too, to say, community, we recognize, we acknowledge the facts, we're not gonna deny them, we're gonna acknowledge the facts, and we also need to acknowledge that we need to work together as government. There's a level of exhaustion with many of these communities that, uh, you know, oh, well, we just uh, are responsible for this media stream, we can't take care of that one. Uh, and we have that responsibility as, you know, serving the people who elected us in this administration, but really the purpose of government of doing that. So that's one basic thing is that we do that step of making sure when we come to communities, we come prepared not just with our roles, but doing what we can to coordinate amongst the whole of government. And the other thing I'll say that I've heard uh, very much, and I hope we hit on this with the critical minerals sector in particular, and the tremendous amount of mining operations that um, we have to do to get to our clean energy goals. And of course, as was mentioned earlier with what's happening internationally with OPEC and the oil markets, the importance of having this domestic supply of energy sourcing, we have to do it right. And these communities are not being directly engaged with the operations that are in their communities. And so that's a big role. You all have to pay, uh, play with your ESG sourcing, downstream, upstream, making sure those companies that you're utilizing for critical minerals are doing those basic things. Are they talking? And this is, you know, it's something we don't think about in this nation, but we very much are like much of the developing uh, South, which is we need to talk to the local tribes. Most of these operations are near and dear to our tribal nations. Let's engage them. You have the force of your purchasing power to say, where's the consultation evidence with the local tribe, the local community? Where's the actual verification that there is a long-term cleanup plan uh, you know, that is basic stuff in many of our other sectors, but we need to have that. You need to demand that. There are operations getting permitted today that do not have that. And because of our structure of federalism, <laughs> I don't have the authority in all cases to say, you, this, this plan is not enough, this permit is insufficient. But we have to use our collective um, powers of society, including you, in your purchasing power from these uh, critical minerals to demand that. I can't stress enough what a critical role it is for everything we talked about, clean energy, clean transportation, you know, getting in there and saying, this lithium needs to come from a clean source. And it's actually possible. A source that we have, I know, a tremendous agenda here in California with the opportunities in the Salton Sea, there is the possibility to extract these minerals in a sustainable way with respect to the community and the tribal nations. So, really uh, uh, look forward to that commitment from all of you. Let's dig down on that a little bit more uh, since we're in a business community conversation. Any other thoughts that you have on what role the businesses have in addressing some of the historic uh, injustices? And do you believe, should businesses be doing more? Yeah, you know, one thing I, by the way, it was really nice to see a high school campus walking <laughs> in here. I saw it. Um, when, when uh, I have the opportunity to speak to young people, college students, high school students, and people ask for career advice, and I say, you know what? We need your mind, your values, your innovation in all sectors of our society. So yes, we need more from all of you here. Uh, government cannot do it alone. Industry cannot do it alone. The you know, NGO world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and like I said, I think from, from where I sit, the perspective of having a very strong commitment, your last panel, everyone knows your energy source has to be 100% clean. And I definitely want to give kudos to the 24-7 commitments. As you know, in my previous role, uh, you know, net zero, net, net, net offset, is, that means EJ continues. Communities with disproportionate impacts continue. It's not till we get to 100%, 100% clean cars, 100% manufacturing, 100% 24-7 energy, or you're never gonna get rid of the 40% gas fleet. That's the kind of thing. So energy sourcing that is true, 100%, 
you have the possibility, especially in this region, in this great state, to get there. 100% clean transportation, heating. We have real challenges there, but we can get there. I was just in Fontana last week, I think it was. Heavy duty vehicles running on clean energy up to 400 miles. The ranges are getting there. We can definitely electrify our freight corridors. All of your purchasing, all of your you know, supply chain needs, you can set realistic goals of getting to that in a clean form. That's uh, you know, another one. And the critical minerals is the other obvious one for the clean energy sector. We could actually lead in a way. Many of these communities have been mined before. You know, uh, I was in the Navajo Nation about a month ago. They were, we collectively as the United States used uh, many of these tribal, especially the Navajo Nation and the Hopi, to extract uranium for our World War II needs. And that uranium mining was done without any foreseeable planning. And the amount of contamination left in the Navajo Nation is our responsibility to deal with. Let's not do it again. There's new mining happening in places like Navajo and otherwise. You know, the, and that one is it's just going to take all of you. You all can do more there than my individual permitting authority that does not apply. I mean, I literally could say probably as a regional administrator in my region with the hundreds of mines, thousands probably now, it applies in 5% of the cases. So you will have more opportunity to make a change there and make sure that these communities are not left with waste for centuries to come. Okay, indeed. I know we're on a rocket ship of a conversation for 20 minutes. We may have time for at least one question from the audience. I did see someone walking along the side. So if you do have a question, I'd ask you to go ahead and provide it. But, but I did want to um, continue to go on. You did acknowledge the fact, thank you so much. You did acknowledge the fact that many of the companies here are providing clean technology solutions to meet our climate goals and reduce emissions. How do you think we could better partner from government or otherwise, or how could we encourage them to make the technology and infrastructure advantage, uh, in infrastructure uh, investments in disadvantaged communities mm -hmm. in particular? Mm -hmm. You know, Rick, you know this from <coughs> days in working on uh, something that's seemingly unrelated, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Mm -hmm. You know, this is where um, when we leave something uh, to incentive alone, to innovation alone and not have the statutory vision for what is needed, all of your innovation is going to apply to a limited population. So we not only need your innovation, your piloting, your you know, feasibility of things that are new, we need your support that that apply across all communities. And that's what happened for some of the major, uh, you know, our climate goals that are, that are in statute, that happened because industry was behind it. Even though all the technology is not there, we can get there when we have that mandate. Um, that happened with groundwater. You right. know, we are in crisis evermore in this state, but we have a framework that, you know, is going to take a lot of local leadership um, and a lot of innovation, but it's there. It's the threshold that has been put into place. So. And I, I'm, I, it may not make sense about the question because you're talking about how do we get there with environmental justice? We get there because we're saying it's 100% for everyone. Everyone's gonna have safe drinking water. Everyone's gonna have water supplies in the future. Everyone's gonna have clean energy. You know, when Governor Newsom set the goal that all cars will be manufactured by 2030, uh, that are they're gonna basically be electric, that, that means that in the future, everyone will have an electric vehicle. That's not what we have today because we've been using incentives to get there. So the transitions are incredibly important. We can't just set a mandate that is infeasible. But your role in making sure we set an appropriate transition, but set it nonetheless, is what is actually going to get us to environmental justice. Because if we just do it through, uh, yeah, and I, I'm probably talking to a more neoliberalism philosophy mindset here, but honestly, we need both. We need that mon we need that mandate, and we need that innovation. Agreed, definitely agreed. All right, a question from the audience: uh, Can you talk about regulations for fugitive methane emissions and regulations limiting the environmental damage of fracking? Mm. 
Okay, so um, there are currently rules that, uh, the, that, again, the EPA has put in place for fugitive methane. So what is fugitive methane? Uh, here in California, you know, we produce a lot of oil. And when we produce oil, we pump it out, and some of that gas comes out as a byproduct, if you want to call it a nice way. We often burn it. We just burn it on site. Um, some, m most of the fugitive emissions from uh, pipelines are from pipelines, pipeline gas, and the connection points to um, you know, pumping stations or whatever you have to make the transportation of this natural gas flow. So um, th this issue of, uh, as we talked to, as mentioned earlier, transitions, there is a big push right now from the fossil fuel industry to utilize natural gas as a transition fuel. And we really want to be cautious about that to very limited sectors the, of, of needing more of that transition because natural gas is methane. It is a super warming pollutant. It is causing the fires. It's causing the heat. Um, so it is better when it comes to local criteria pollution. And that's why it's so attractive because you're not doing all the little particulates that come out with diesel. And it is better health-wise. But we have the option to leapfrog that and get to electric. So that, you know, methane capture is so important. It's something we need to do during the transition. I know we, carbon capture, other, those things are needed during our transition. But we can't lose sight about getting to the full non-fossil solution. In the last 30 seconds, another audience question. While we're setting goals for reducing emissions, what type of goals should we set to make communities more resilient against the effect of climate change? I know you have a 30-second answer here. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot there. <laughs> well, um, oh my gosh, it's so important. Uh, you know, I think it comes about, back down to not losing sight as we have these immense climate impacts that we have to take into consideration that social impact. As you know, uh, Betty mentioned already, and I think Leanne mentioned earlier, I was kind of watching it on the tube here. That was very, very nice, by the way, to be able to watch it on YouTube. Um, but it, it's just the underlying racism, the underlying classism that's existed in our society. You can't just make it, you can't just deal with an issue today without dealing with those systemic ones. So we're, we're talking about excessive heating. We got to attack the housing issues, the dilapidated, you know, we got to get the housing infrastructure up, which often means, I know the governor put out a billion dollar program for uh, building decarbonization, which is awesome. But guess what? Learning from my previous rule, it's going to cost at least $7,000 more per household that is not a new home. You're going to need to help upgrade the panel, the weatherization, to actually make it possible to get it to be an all electric home. And we should do that. We should do it because it's a great thing. We're not just re getting ready for this extreme heat or extreme cold or whatever you, the crisis is. We're repairing the legacy of environmental injustice, of environmental racism, and we're acknowledging it. And we're saying, as a society, we want to pay for that. And we want to make sure that we're all transitioning. So um, that's just one example. There are many more, <laughs> many, many more. Well, thank you. This conversation has been wonderful. The President Biden could have made a better choice in a an an Region 9 administrator for someone that has true environmental justice and true equity and passion for communities of color at their hearts. So thank you for being there, and thank, thank you for you. engaging the conversation. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage one more time SVLG's Senior Vice President of Climate, Tim McRae. All right, this is the closing. Before we go, I just have a few folks that we must thank. Western Digital for their thought leadership, Lyft for their innovator sponsorship, Oracle for providing the space and the food, Express Media for providing the streaming platform, our elected officials who took their time from their busy schedules to be here. I want to ask if there's any of you who would like to host an event now that we're doing in-person events again, uh, like this with us in the future, please let us know. You can email events at svlg.org. And finally, thank you for coming. I know it's uh, Tough to do so in the current environment. We really appreciate you coming out, uh, being at our first in-person in event. Thank you, and have a great rest of your day.
Another big thank you to Express Media, our partners here at ESG to Carbon Free. I'm Riley Robbins, SVP of Media and Events for SVLG. See you next time.